all, first of all, to, to this meeting. There's a lot to cover. Um, I also welcome uh, Martina Anderson, uh, Colin McGrath and George Robinson, uh, who are joining us on, on Starleaf, uh, and will no doubt have, have good input into the, the meeting. Um, this meeting will be recorded um, and broadcast throughout the Parliament building uh, and online. Um, and if I can remind members, are welcome to use their mobile devices as long as they keep them in airplane mode uh, and devices are, are uh, muted and keep them away from the, uh, the, the devices here. Um, Apologies. Uh, I have got no apologies. Uh, is anybody, uh, we're all here, are we? Yep. We're all here, so there's no apologies. Uh, draft minutes. Um, the draft minutes of the meeting are held, on the, uh, which was held on the 30th of September 2020, are at page five of the meeting pack. If members are content that the minutes are true reflection of the proceedings of the meeting, uh, if, so, if so, could you please indicate? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, matters arising. There's uh, no matters arising. Um, briefing by the First and Deputy First Minister. I refer members to page 11 of the meeting pack and page 3 uh, of the table pack. Uh, a departmental briefing paper uh, has not yet been received. Uh, page 3 of the table pack for a copy of the urgent oral statement made by the First uh, and Deputy First Minister on the appointment of the Commissioner for the Survivor of Institutional Childhood Abuse, uh, Fiona Rand. Uh, Fiona is due to take up our post on the 14th uh, of December, and you may wish to welcome the appointment uh, and suggest that the Commissioner uh, is invited to brief the Committee at the end of January uh, 2021. I look as if I'm in the naughty corner here, Chair. Yeah, you do. But, uh... well, Hello. We've got Christopher on the other side. Christopher on the other side. I definitely feel that there's a bit of DUP bias. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for coming along. I, I know um, how busy you are, and these sessions are uh, extremely important to uh, this committee, and I know you see them as extremely important for you to be able to discharge your duties uh, as well. Um, so we do thank you um, for attending. Um, it is being recorded um, by Hansard, and transcript will be published uh, on the committee's uh, website. Um, so we'll sit back and, and uh, happy enough for you to complete the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you for the committee inviting us along here today. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I want to apologise for the lack of briefing papers for today's session. The committee will be aware that we've had significant challenges over this last week in relation to the changing situation with COVID, and it has required our significant focus, uh, not just ourselves, but across the whole of the executive, of course, and I want to reassure the committee that we are committed to our ongoing engagement, as you've said in your opening remarks, Chair, uh, and we will do all that we can to ensure that papers are issued in accordance with the guidelines of future. Um, we're going to give an overview of the current uh, work going on in the department, and I want to begin with the process to appoint a new head of the civil service, which has... Uh, been uh, at the top of our agenda and of course the position of Hawks is a critical role, uh, one of significant responsibility uh, including leading almost 23,000 civil servants to serve the institutions of government and indeed all our citizens through the provision of public services and the importance of the role cannot be underestimated at this critical time as we continue to manage our response to and recovery from the coronavirus pandemic course preparations for our EU exit and delivering on our commitments set out in the new decade new approach document. Uh, as an executive we're addressing significant health societal and economic issues and we're working to be in the best possible place to rebuild our economy, rejuvenate our society and transform uh, our public services. Members will be aware that the Deputy First Minister and myself made a statement to the Assembly on the 26th of September to confirm that planning for a recruitment competition to appoint a successor to David Sterling began shortly after he announced his retirement in December of last year. Uh, the recruitment process, like the 2016 Hawks competition, uh, was via open recruitment. Uh, this vacancy was advertised locally, nationally and internationally with the aim of trying to attract as wide and diverse a pool of applicants as we could find. 
Stage one took place on the 26th of August and was chaired by the chair of the Northern Ireland Civil Service Commissioners with two independent panel members, one from the Northern Ireland private sector and the other from the Scottish Government. Uh, those successful at first stage interviews then attended an interview with the Deputy First Minister and myself on the 23rd of September. Regrettably, a joint selection decision was not reached and therefore an appointment was not made at this time. As per our statement to the House on the 26th of September, we're now urgently working to put in place appropriate interim arrangements and uh, in parallel considering how best to fill this crucial role uh, on a substantive basis uh, as well. Moving on to the programme for government then, which I know uh, this, depart this uh, committee will be very interested in. The executive discussed its approach to COVID-19 recovery and the programme for government in July, and we agreed a two-stage approach. Firstly, an activity-based recovery programme uh, is to be developed uh, as the basis for driving economic health and societal recovery, which will continue for the remainder of uh, this year up to uh, the end of the financial year next year. Secondly, a new outcomes-based strategic programme for government is to be developed, developed for commencement for from April 2021, and we've had good work already undertaken by officials on that, including the establishment of formal project arrangements by the Northern Ireland Civil Service Board, and an analysis of what is currently known about people's perceptions of the existing 12 outcomes taking on board lessons learned by those most closely involved in taking forward uh, the draft programme for government which was developed back in 2016. So in terms of immediate plans for recovery, I'm going to cover that and then the Deputy First Minister will cover the, the longer term uh, programme for government. Uh, the executive's pathway to recovery uh, and the relaxation during the early summer of many of the restrictions that were put in place through the coronavirus regulations uh, represented the first phase in the recovery process. However, recovery from COVID-19 goes much further than that. As we've seen over recent weeks, infection rates have increased. Uh, COVID-19 still remains in our community. And so the economic, health and societal challenges facing us are significant. Our approach to recovery must therefore remain flexible and adaptable in the circumstances. Unfortunately, an example of this has been the need to introduce restrictions on hospitality closing times and also in domestic settings to address the concerning levels of transmission across the community. And unfortunately, uh, Chair, those figures that have just been released today continue to concern us greatly, and uh, we have to take all of that into consideration. But in terms of recovery, um, it means taking steps now to protect vulnerable and viable sectors uh, and essential services, to avoid structural failures and job losses, while medium to long term solutions uh, are developed as well. And it means promoting sectors and talent which have the potential for growth so that they can, play, they can develop over the medium to long term and play their role in economic and societal well-being. It also means taking proactive steps with communities to protect the vulnerable, especially uh, in autumn and winter. So we have recently agreed a recovery framework, uh, which is aimed at progressing a cohesive approach across the whole of government. <coughs> so we're talking about economic, health, societal recovery, which has uh, the citizen uh, at the very centre of everything we do. Because we're clear that recovery is not about getting us back to where we were before, rather uh, about providing the foundation uh, for renewal, uh, so that we're aiming, that's what we're aiming for uh, in our programme for government. Finally, for my part, uh, Chair, I wanted to talk about EU exit, future relations, um, and that in recent weeks there's been important engagement with the UK government and the EU through Joint Ministerial Committee, European Negotiations, and the Deputy First Minister and I, along with Junior Minister Lyons and Junior Minister Kearney, attended the last meeting of that, which was on the 3rd of September. <coughs> we also took the opportunity to highlight our concerns about the limited time available for an agreement on the future relationship to be concluded, ratified and implemented, and the need for political intervention to reach agreement. We emphasised the need to <coughs> take into account the interactions between the negotiations on the future relationship and the protocol, uh, particularly in some key areas such as SPS checks. 
And in terms of operational readiness, we emphasised the need for appropriate ministerial engagement and set out our concerns on the large volume of EU exit legislation that is required before the end of the transition period, including the continuing lack of clarity on the implementation of the protocol. So progress has been made on common frameworks. Uh, we've endorsed the outline frameworks on nutrition health uh, claim composition, labelling and hazardous uh, substance planning. However, we've noted that many of the frameworks brought forward uh, would be impacted by the protocol, and we've emphasised that our endorsement must be viewed from that perspective. On the UK internal market, we've reiterated the need for uh, forthcoming legislation to include the commitment to unfettered access. And as you know, departments continue to undertake operational readiness planning, which includes the option of a, a non-negotiated outcome, which we very much hope is not the case. The work builds on Operation Yellowhammer planning work, which was completed in the lead up to a potential no deal exit in 2019. So given the ever-shortening time scale until the end of the transition period, it's important that we prepare on a collaborative basis uh, with UK government uh, and officials continue to engage with counterparts uh, in UK government and ministers are involved in quadrilateral meetings with the Paymaster General and indeed with other devolved administrations which look to operational readiness. We also need to build on our liaison with the Irish government, of course, on preparedness for the north-south dimension as well. Operational readiness planning is being taken forward in parallel with the COVID-19 response and recovery to ensure that they are considered together and the Northern Ireland hub remains capable of being stood up should it be required, uh, although it hasn't been stood up to date and we are keeping uh, a close eye on that issue. Uh, undoubtedly, the top cross-cutting priority issue for us remains clarity on the implementation of the protocol and the impact uh, on our businesses and citizens. Um, both the junior ministers were updated on the implementation of the protocol at the Joint Committee on the 28th of September. Our key objective remains to secure unfettered access for Northern Ireland goods to the GB market, as well as the minimum possible friction on east to west movement of goods. So that commitment for legislative underpinning of that unfettered access was of course uh, set out in the new decade, new approach, and that's vitally important for uh, our businesses and our citizens. Access to the GB market is of vital importance, um, and we're pressing UK government to ensure the unfettered access commitment to the, in the command paper is delivered, and uh, we need that, of course, to support current trade and future strength uh, of the economy. There was Northern Ireland Business Guidance uh, published uh, in August, and that was an important step forward. Uh, but as recognised in the guidance, there's still a number of issues that need to be uh, clarified. So we're continuing to liaise with uh, our colleagues in the UK government, and uh, we'll keep the committee updated in relation to any progress there. So I pass on to the Deputy First Minister. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. And I also want to say thanks for the committee for having us here today. And I'm going to pick up on a few... Um, issues, not, not least the, the announcement which we were able to make yesterday where we were um, obviously delighted to be able to announce the appointment of Fiona Ryan as the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse. I think that was a very significant day for victims and for survivors and, and the families and I know that many members took the opportunity to ask questions um, yesterday. So we now have a situation where the redress board has been established, we have made the appointment of a statutory commissioner but there's obviously still significant work which lies ahead, including the memorial and, and, and the apology and support services then for um, making sure that those structures are in place. So we look forward to working with Fiona, as I'm sure the committee does too. She advocates for the interests of victims and survivors in this important and sensitive role. And we really do hope that the relationship between Fiona and the various victims and survivors groups flourishes. And we have every confidence that she will use her experience and her ability for the benefit of those that she will represent in her new role. Just on the issue then of historical institutional abuse, the committee will be aware that um, the address board opened for applications on the 31st of March and um, seven weeks later then the first compensation payments were made and that was all done within the time scales set out by the President so that's something that we very much welcome and as of the end of September 570 applications have been received and the panel has made determinations totalling 4.1 million and paying out a total of 2.17 million. The Hart report recommended um, that the executive and those who were responsible for each of the institutional institutions investigated by the inquiry where it found systemic failings should make public apology 
and as a wholehearted and unconditional negotiation or renegos recognition even of the failures of the past. The interim advocate is continuing to work with victims and survivors groups in the coming weeks to advise in the language that they would like to see in an apology. The interim advocate's report is expected on the 16th of October, and then alongside this, TEO officials have had very positive and helpful engagements with Savvy on these issues also. Then, just in terms of rights and dedicated mechanism, in terms of our preparations for Brexit, the protocol reflects the commitment made by the British Government to uphold the Good Friday Agreement, and in particular that the withdrawal from the EU will not lead to any diminution of rights, safeguards and equality of opportunity, as set out in the Good Friday Agreement. This commitment is to be implemented by a dedicated mechanism, for example, i.e. by providing new oversight powers to the Human Rights Commission and the Quality Commission with adequate resources. The withdrawal agreement gives legal effect to the protocol commitment by amending the 1998 Act to provide the CNI and the NIHRC with new oversight powers. It's intended that the dedicated mechanism will come into effect at the end of the implementation period. In light of the resources committed by the NIO to cover staffing and other associated costs of the dedicated mechanism, the Equality Commission has formally agreed to act as part of the dedicated mechanism. The Equality Commission is in the process of putting its team in place and has recently appointed a director for the new unit following pu um, public competition and other appointments are in progress. And I know that the committee, I believe, was recently briefed by the Equality Commission on that work. Um, on the internal market bill, then, the British Government has uh, sent a letter to Minister Dodds ahead of the bill's introduction to provide an overview of the bill and provide analysis of its devolution impact. The provisions in the bill which the British Government have identified as needing our consent include, among many other things, the market access commitment, subsidy control and financial assistance. These areas of consent cut across responsibilities of more than one department and now have to be considered by the executive. And um, together with the executive colleagues, we're considering this devolution analysis and will bring results to the Assembly and Executive and indeed this um, committee in due course. Just to follow on from uh, the First Minister's comments around um, the programme for government, just to speak a little about the longer term development of the PFG. Uh, ministers individually and collectively are fully committed to the development of the outcomes based uh, programme for government as the key to thinking and working beyond organisational boundaries as a basis for tackling entrenched and what are often complex social problems and improving quality of life conditions for all. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated clearly the interconnectedness of economic and social policy, and it's also sent a stark reminder to us all of the need for a whole of government approach when it comes to public service planning and delivery. So developing an all new PFG is a significant commitment which will require direct engagement and support from individual ministers, the executive as a whole, permanent secretaries and lead policy officials. We're also committed to working closely with stakeholders and other sectors and it's important that um, all these things are in the PFG itself is co-designed with those who are impacted by it. We will, of course, be happy to discuss PF, uh, PFG development proposals with the committee and provide regular updates as the work progresses and senior TEO officials will also be available to provide detailed briefings as the committee might find helpful. Just to speak then just about um, the COVID approach and whilst um, COVID, as we know, is primarily a health, um, is a primarily health pandemic, but it's also causing significant societal and economic impacts. And the committee will know that the executive's response therefore aims to continually try and deliver a balanced package of measures across these areas that will target support where it's needed most. Our approach continues to be flexible in responding to the emergent situation and the figures that we actually have seen today and probably committee members who've been in the room won't have seen yet, but they are um, uh, seriously worrying um, in terms of the exponential rise in positive case cases and alongside that the number of people who have been admitted to hospital. So we have um, continued to try and uh, respond to this emerging situation and most recently that has included the introduction of restrictions in domestic settings and on hospitality closing times. And we're continuing to keep that situation under close review and we're prepared to respond um, as necessary to flatten the rate of infection and ultimately save lives. From a scientific perspective, it seems unlikely that the current restrictions will be sufficient to bring or back to less than one and for us to be able to maintain that. And single interventions are unlikely to be sufficient so, and a package of interventions will always be required to prevent that exponential rise in the virus. So as an executive, we are currently 
uh, considering further measures to bring down COVID-19 transmission by non-pharmaceutical interventions, so by means other than medicines, including the eventual vaccines. However, uh, just to be clear, at this stage we are not in lockdown, um, so hospitality and other businesses continue to be the subject to strict guidance, regulation and appropriate enforcement where necessary. Indeed, the junior ministers are chairing a multi-agency group to address the wider issue of enforcement across a range of settings. However, um, as we all know, this is not just about enforcement, it's about us all working in partnership and it's about everyone playing their part in helping to tackle the virus. We've tried to be and we remain uh, trying to be dynamic and flexible in responding to the situation and, and all the, the, the measures which we take are necessary and proportionate and you know, as required and always guided by the latest scientific and medical <coughs> advice. Our approach has always been subject to continual review in response to the change in nature of the pandemic from where we were in the introduction of the, of the restrictions and the regulations and lockdown in March through the carefully managed relaxation of restrictions in line with our pathway to recovery and then more recently the reintroduction of restrictions um, in terms of hospi clo hospitality closing times and in domestic sentence. Um, so we're going to have to work our way through this um, but we are concerned about the current situation but the executive will discuss this um, in, a, in a more detailed way over the course of um, today and until our executive meeting um, tomorrow. We continue just to try and raise awareness as we work through the winter months and we have looked very carefully at our executive information service and how we deliver messages and how we target in particular you know, young people. Um, so we've developed a, prim a primarily digital campaign aimed at young people aged 16 to 25 to try and reinforce the public health message to that audience. Um, so that's a, a, I suppose a, a whistle stop sort of um, skirt through quite quite a number of issues. But I'm happy to take any questions from committee members. Uh, thank you, Deputy First Minister. Thank you, First Minister, um, for, for that briefing. Um, uh, it's it's sobering to, to listen to what's going on. You're dealing with a lot uh, at the minute, and, and we appreciate how what you are dealing with. No doubt there'll be lots of questions from the members. First of all, here and those who are who are online, and I would ask all members to try and have a bit of brevity so we can get as many questions in uh, as we possibly can. But could I ask, first of all, um, and about COVID and trying to get a sense of it as, as you see it in the, in the wider sense? Um, and I know, First Minister, you said that look, lockdown is not inevitable. Um, and then the First Minister, you were saying there has to be a suite of measures that have to be put in place. But if we are continuing in the way we are now, with the rise of cases as they are now, and people are still talking about that sort of fire break, that, that sort of circuit breaker, um, you know, can you give us a sense of whether we are still hurtling towards that, probably closer to the end of the month or not? Well, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that it's evident for itself that we are in a situation where the number of cases continue to rise. And I think today's uh, number will will startle people again. And I think the f when you take just not just the rise in, in the number of um, positive cases, but also the fact that we now have a rise to, I think it's 106? 106. 106, 106 yeah. uh, people who have now been admitted to hospital. So that shows that the pressure is starting to come very strongly back on the health service. And we all can remember back to March when that was the biggest fear that we had. The health service would become overrun. We won't be able to respond to the crisis. So not to be alarmist to the public, but we're in a very grave situation. We've always tried to take a very reasoned and, and proportionate approach, and that's the commitment that we made to the public. You know, we brought in quite draconian legislation. That remains our approach. We take everything in the round. We have to be guided by the public health advice. And that's why I think we need to have um, more conversation at the executive. We haven't arrived at a, you know, what's next at this moment in time, but certainly we will be discussing this in the days ahead as, as a whole collective executive, but there's no doubt that the, the Chief Medical Officer's advice, the Chief Scientific Officer's advice has been that measures, <coughs> single measures, so for example household restrictions in itself um, will not be effective in order to combat the rise, um, that it may take multiple measures. So everything's on the table and we have to look at everything, but there are a number of priorities I think that we would identify for ourselves and that would be you know um we want to keep our schools open we want to make sure that children aren't any further disadvantaged by um not being able to attend school we want to be able to um so if we have to take measures again we want to be able to support families who are struggling and who will be struggling because they don't have um perhaps you know they're they're laid off or you know the, the financial implications that come with this 
and we have to protect our health service and our healthcare workers who are, we're going to be dependent on. So every decision we take is based on the round and, and with all those factors in mind. Um, we do know this is a worrying time for the public again. I think the message that we would want to drive home again is, is help us to help us to, to, to deal with the situation and, and we very much remind people of the partnership approach which we set out from the day one of the pandemic that we have the ability to stop the rise and that's getting back to basics. It is actually getting back to washing our hands and um, staying apart and doing all the things that we had set out very clearly from the start of this pandemic. So yes, we do have it within our hands to stop the spread. Um, I think what we've been concerned about since um, the summer has been compliance issues and we understand that. We understand that people have become more relaxed. But today we have 828 um, new positive cases. Uh, we have 106 people in hospitals, 14 of them in ICU. So um, those figures are starting to ramp up again. Um, that, of course, concerns us. And, and we will listen very carefully to what our advisors have to say about that tomorrow, recognising that there is always a lag between positive cases and hospital admissions. But, Chair and Members, this is a balancing act that I think um, people realise that we're on a tightrope. Um, because if we take uh, interventions that are not proportionate and not necessary, then that has a huge impact on society, on people's freedoms, um, on the fact that people need to be able to go to work and to earn money and to keep their families uh, in a good place. So we have to balance all of those things when we look at the figures and when we look at the advice that's given to us from our medical side. We also have to look at, and you've seen this playing out in other jurisdictions <laughs> over this past number of days, whether it's the Republic of Ireland or Scotland today, they will have to take into account the impact on wider issues as well as health. So, yes, it is a, a huge piece of work that we're engaged in at present, and uh, we, we have to take all these decisions uh, together as an executive, and there's never been a more important time for the executive to work together, I feel, uh, because we're taking decisions uh, that have, will be of great moment and will have a huge impact, uh, whatever we decide to do, uh, on the people of Northern Ireland. Uh, I, and you're right, uh, First Minister, I mean, this is the time where the executive has to work together you, you, without a shadow of a doubt, and it's worrying times, I suppose, for our, our citizens. Uh, and I guess the reason I ask that question is because that concern is out there, that conversation is out there, and I suppose people's mindset, having been locked down once before, mm. are thinking, you know, will it happen again? I guess there's, I guess what I'm asking you really is, is you know, will, will there be trying to forward think, will there be plenty of lead up time so people know, look, this is coming, so you can be prepared for this, you know, as opposed to, and it's not everybody's fault, as opposed to saying on a Thursday, Monday we're in lockdown. That, that's the sort of, um, sort, of, sort of query. Well, of course, that's what happened in March, and I know that came as a, a huge shock to everyone. Um, and of course, we're not in March now. Things have moved on. We have a better knowledge, uh, albeit it's still at an early stage of this virus. Uh, we do have treatments in place now. We have a better understanding. Um, so all of those things are taken into consideration. Uh, as the Deputy First Minister has said, we do have a priority around our younger people. We know that some of them have been vilified in the press recently around not keeping to the rules and what have you. But we also recognise that they are having a very difficult time at present. They're having to deal with restrictions that none of us had to deal with when we were that age. Uh, and we were going out and looking for jobs and we were perhaps going to the next stage of our life at further education and what have you. So we recognise all of that, but we're asking them to please go back to basics and to do all of the things that we're asking you to do, and then we can get through this. And by the time we get a vaccine, then we will be able to go back to normal and go back to uh, that life that we all look back at now and wish we were at again. So it is important that we all work together. Um, I know it's a very difficult time, um, but just going back to the very, uh, and I know some people think they're very boring messages, but they're very effective messages. Washing your hands, social distancing, wearing a mask in the appropriate places, uh, and making sure that we do everything that we can to break the transmission of this virus. I think on your on your point of giving people notice, that's <coughs> the ideal. That is the ideal. Of course, if we have to take measures, we want to give people notice. Sometimes these, with the way the virus is developing, it just comes comes at such a rate that you have to move at, at speed. And quite often we would listen to different pieces of evidence from chief medical officer, or chief scientific officer, 
who would tell us that you know by delaying by one day, two days, that they would give you figures that shows that this is how much it would rise. So these are things that you always have to weigh up. But ideally, yes, if you had to move to more stringent measures, as much notice as possible you can give people in order to allow people to plan because this is real life interruption. This is your childcare arrangement. This is about mm. your working from home. This is about, you know, somebody who's got a wedding planned. You know, it's, it's, it's about just real life scenarios. And we understand how difficult this is for people as we always said throughout the, the, the months of March and April and May, you know, we're mummies, you know, daughters. We have the same challenges, the same concerns that every family are going through right now. Um, we try to factor that into all of our decision making. Um, so on the point just of giving people notice where we can, we will. It isn't always possible, but where we can, we will. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a fair point. Uh, if I can move on to uh, programme for government and, and, uh, and the congestion we're now going to get, and we're going to get congestion through uh, EU exit legislation, programme for government, COVID environment we're in, uh, uh, and the New Deal, uh, new decade, new approach um, document. Just on the latter, uh, we, we have a briefing scheduled for, for officials on the 11th of November on the TO work on strands on, under NDNA. Um, in advance of that, could you let us know the likely timelines, likely timelines for the introduction of the three language culture bills? Well, these are things that we're considering at present. Um, we recognise that some of the NDNA uh, pieces that we should have been already dealing with have been delayed due to COVID, frankly. Um, officials are um, now working through a piece of work around prioritising the NDNA because I think we recognise that there's a need to do that at this particular point in time. And I hope, Chair, that in the very near future we will be able to give you a timeline in relation to that um, piece that you've just mentioned and indeed uh, other issues as well which I think we would like to see progressing. But as I said um, at our party leaders meeting uh, on Friday, uh, it is important that we recognise that NDNA covers five different parties. Therefore, we all have different priorities. So it's important that we all work together to push through uh, on those priorities uh, in recognition that we are trying to be as collective as we possibly can as we move forward. Thank you. So we have 18 months left of this mandate. It'll be a mandate that none of us will forget in a hurry. Um, Three years of the institutions being down, trying to, to get it back together. We finally get it back together in January, and then we're faced with a, with a global pandemic. So um, I think it's been challenging for all, for all those reasons. But we all got back together in, a, in, a, in, a, in the executive, in the assembly, uh, based on the NDNA um, proposals. So it's really, really important that we see those things over the line and we see them um, delivered. That, that, because that in itself will demonstrate you know, party of esteem and mutual respect for each other. So. Um, I want to see all these things um, now um, set out very clearly in a time frame that we can all work to and we deliver over the course of the rest of the, of the mandate. Um, but 18 months left isn't a long time for us to do a lot of the things that we want um, to be able to do, but it's important that we're going to have to prioritise the work of PFG, you know, the NDNA commitments, dealing with COVID, post-Brexit um, scenario. Um, you can see the challenges that we we'll have both in, in political leadership and even as a, as a civil service to be able to cope with managing all those things. And you're right, Deputy First Minister. Um, and I guess for this committee, because we would have to scrutinise that bill that came in in regards to languages and the cultural bill, you know, and it's a, it's a hefty piece of work. And, and my understanding, all three bills have to come through at the same, at the same time. Mm -hmm. Is it likely that it will make it through in this mandate? Do you think? Or Yes, yes. yes. Absolutely. No, no, that's a fair answer. That's a fair answer. I don't need to <laughs> elaborate on that. So the words cut out first. And just a very brief one, if I can, um, uh, Deputy First Minister. Just a question I asked you on Thursday about the the, uh, the new um, Cossica, yes. uh, and I asked about the interim, and, and I didn't quite get your answer properly. Will Brendan McAllister cease in his role mid October, but advise? Or will he stay in his role mid-October um, as an interim until the new one comes in? I wasn't quite sure if I got that. So I'm advised that he, that just the nature of the office, you have to have a, a head in yeah. place. So I'm advised that um, that he will stay in place, but there is conversation ongoing with him around, for example, the commitment that's required from him in the period between now and the 14th of December, whenever the new commissioner will take up her post. That's as much as I can say to you, but I know that we're going to be meeting actually with him yeah. in the next 
I think maybe it's the 14th or something of this month. So we'll discuss those things more at that stage. Okay, no, no thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to open this up. I'm, I'm going to offer to, to um, Colin first for, for questions, and after Colin it will be Pat and then Emma. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and thank you to the um, Joint First Ministers for the presentation today. I suppose I was going to um, take a look just at um, the issue of obviously the number of cases are rising, the number of hospitalisations are, are increasing, and nobody um, wants to see either of those. But is there a sense? Is the messaging correct? Is the messaging getting through? Because if the messaging was effective and working, people were complying, then the numbers should be going down. But that's not the case. And is there a need to review the messaging to make sure uh, that it is properly effective and, and reaching out what we need to get to people? Well, Colm, I think people are fed up with COVID-19. Uh, I know certainly I'm fed up with COVID-19, and uh, I think people just want to be over and done with. And during the summer months, when it was at a low ebb, um, we know it's a seasonal uh, virus, so it becomes more vir virulent, if you like, when the weather changes and we come into the autumn and winter time. Uh, and I think people look at the number of cases, and up until now, they look at the number of hospitalizations and say, well, they're not really that large, and there's not that many people passing away due to COVID. So really, maybe it's less uh, impactive as, than it was back in, in March and April. And that would be a false thing to think, um, from my perspective, because we are advised very clearly that there is about a three-week lag between the growth in the number of cases and the number of hospitalisations. So we haven't, we haven't gone through that lag yet, but already we're starting to see hospitalisations rise to 106 today. Uh, and then the number of ICU cases start to go up as well. And then there's a further lag then until the number of deaths start to increase. So that's what we're concerned about. I can understand from a public point of view, people are looking at the number of deaths or looking at the number of hospitalizations and saying, well, I don't know what we're worried about. It's young people uh, getting the disease. They can carry the disease and move on with their lives. That's wrong as well, of course, because you can suffer from what we now call long COVID, that impact on your body that's with you for a long period of time. And then, of course, the, the damage of carrying the virus into your home with your elderly parents, your elderly grandparents, vulnerable friends and family as well. So I would just appeal to people, so whilst they're looking at all of this and saying it's not going to impact on me, I want them to think about the fact that there's 400 students now at Queen's that are self-isolating. I want them to think about the fact that this is going to have an impact on our lives unless we start taking those very clear messages, and I think they are clear messages, very basic messages about washing your hands, social distancing, mask wearing in the appropriate place, and keeping that all to the fore. And that, I mean, those are simple messages, so we need to get that through. The messages are simple, but it's about the compliance that I'm concerned about at present. And so, as Michelle has said, we've worked with EIS to try and get out some more messages on our digital platforms and try to say to people that this will impact and we're not crying wolf. We're actually trying to deal with this issue. That doesn't mean to say we're not taking into account all of the issues I've referred to in terms of the economy, in terms of society, in terms of your family. We're very much aware of those things as well. But please, if you do the right thing, then you won't have to have tighter restrictions. And that's the point I was making at the beginning of this week. Yeah, I don't think there's enough that more really to add to that, um, Chair. I mean, I think that there is a mixture, a mixed bag of feeling out there. So there is the fed up with COVID and the restrictions and the implications it has for your life. There's the, I don't like it. Just, you know, I just think that you see a rise in this sort of conspiracy theory around, you know, people sort of speculating as to the... The, the genuineness of it all. Um, you just have a, have a whole mixed bag of feeling out there. But things are going to get worse if people don't act now. That is an inevitability. Um, so what happens next um, is, is really dependent on human behaviour. And so that's why I think, I mean, the messaging itself, you have to continually to look at that. But in order to be effective in messaging, you have to you know repeat your message. And the basic message is still the fundamental message because that's the thing that actually can arrest the situation but we are looking at the targeted campaigns so the 16 to 24 you know not everybody reads newspapers or follows the news programs but they may be on different social media platforms and there's a particular demographic that will follow different social media so 
we're targeting those things now as a way to try and reach more people. Yeah, I, think, I suppose that, that, that it's a key point is that maybe changing how the message is presented, because if it's the same message presented in the same way, people will get bored of it after six months and switch off. So finding different ways to be able to deliver that message would be important. C can I ask you a question um, moving on? We have a, a presentation up after about the common frameworks. And obviously Brexit is looming in less than 90 days. And we have um, the, the issue of that EU legislative uh, standardization across Europe will be removed and those common frameworks will be required. And obviously Barmy Boris and his team are going to have to try and deliver them. But as I understand that there are over 40 uh, common frameworks which will need to be put in place. And at the moment, we're only going to be ready on the 1st of January with five of them. I mean, have you got a flavor of what deficit that's going to cause uh, or what problems that will create within industry and commerce and, and everyday life if we're short all of those uh, common frameworks and they're not in place in time? I think as the, as the Chair knows that um, we're sitting at this moment in time where we're only a short number of weeks um, away from the end of the year and we're still unsure of the outcome. So there's so many things that are still uh, unclear to us. Um, I think that's that's posing huge challenges for us in, in order to be able to prepare. You know, because I know you've had numerous briefings from officials and as you say, you're going to discuss the common frameworks later on um, today as well. But you know the volume of work that we're having to deal with is immense. And to be able to respond to these things um, in the absence of having clarity isn't, is not is far from uh, far from good. There's 40 active frameworks, um, 18 of which we need a legislative framework. Um, will be required. 22 where non legislative framework is being considered, and then 115 policy areas have been identified as no longer requiring a framework agreement. So, that even to look at that as a scale of work is, is just incredible. Um, and you'll be able to talk about that in more detail later. But I just think that the, the lack of clarity that we have right now is posing huge, huge challenges for us. Um, clearly, we're in this ninth round of, of negotiation. Clearly, um, we, there, there's this potential for a tunnel you know, type negotiation and will that produce something? Either way, even if it does produce something, we're still running right to the wire in order to be able to respond in the way in which we need to. Um, some of this is outside of our control because we're not at the negotiating table clearly, um, but that's our our mantra in every engagement that we've had um, at the Joint Minister <coughs> um, Forum uh, and every other forum is that this call for clarity. So I know that officials are coming in after we leave, Colm, um, but that five frameworks have been identified as fully implementable by the 31st of December, um, but the remaining active frameworks, so the remainder of those 40 active frameworks, uh, are, will undergo a review and assessment by November. Uh, and the aim is to progress to all provisional confirmation. So there's provisional confirmation and there's full confirmation. So they're hoping by the end of November to have the 40 that are active uh, in the space where we can have provisional confirmation. And I think that would be very helpful if that can be achieved. But as I say, Andrew will give you a more up-to-date uh, detail on that when he comes. Thank you. And a very quick question, just finally, Chair. Chair, there, there does seem to be a bit of a crisis of openness and transparency within the Executive Office. Um, since uh, the beginning of September, Ministers, your department has been asked over 90 Assembly questions, and you've answered two. That uh, may have changed from yesterday, but that's where it was yesterday. I'm personally waiting on a reply to 43 questions that have been put through. I mean, it's starting to get the impression that you've either something to hide or that there's just an inability to answer them. And whilst I appreciate that we're in the middle of a pandemic, there still is normal work and there still is openness and transparency. And we need a commitment that those uh, that that information will be provided because it is the basis of democracy. Can I get that commitment from you today? Well, I think to say that there's a crisis in terms of openness and transparency is the best bit of hyperbole I've heard in quite a while, Colm, um, because well, uh, like both, you. both Michelle and I are in front of the chamber uh, most, most weeks. Uh, we're here today answering questions. As you know, during the pandemic, uh, written questions were suspended to try and give us the space to deal with all of the things that we needed to deal with. Rightly, those came back online again. Um, I have no difficulty in giving you uh, an absolute commitment on openness and transparency sitting here as First Minister because we have absolutely nothing to hide. Uh, far from it. And I can give the same commitment. There's certainly no crisis of openness. Um, we're here in the spirit of openness. We're here because we're here to be questioned and, and pr provide answers. So. If there are outstanding questions, then we can give that commitment to 
look at them and make sure that they are answered. Okay, well, the proof of the uh, pudding is in the eating, as they say, so we'll see how many answers we get in the next period. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Pat? Okay, thanks, Chair. <coughs> um, uh, first of all, I want to welcome the appointment of the Commissioner uh, yesterday for uh, survivors of childhood institutional abuse. Uh, I'm sure uh, the survivors uh, involved there will particularly welcome that appointment. Uh, I note the tenure for the Victims Commissioner has ended and, and I'm sure there will be progress uh, on that matter uh, in the near future. Danny Kennahan has also been appointed as Veterans Commissioner. I'm not sure if uh, that will have any impact on me or not, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure some people will welcome it. But just picking up on the point that Doug was making earlier uh, around the issue of languages and culture, uh, many of us would have expected the appointment of an Irish language commissioner before now, and I understand COVID has delayed a lot of issues, but uh, many people would be eager that there would be progress on that issue, certainly this side of Christmas. So uh, there's no real question there, I'm, I'm just making that point. I wanted to pick up on the, the issue of the head of the civil service uh, and the First Minister said in her presentation that interim arrangements would be put in place. I wonder could uh, either of you expand on, on what those interim arrangements are going to be and when we can expect some sort of permanent appointment to that post. Thanks. Thanks um, Pat. So the, the Commissioner or the Commissioner's point, I know it's not a question, but just to say, yes, um, we want to get the legislation progressed, as we've just said, and then have the Commissioner put in place as soon as possible. Um, on the on the Hawks recruitment, you know, the process has concluded without a candidate being successfully appointed, um, and we're very keen to, to move this on um, as quickly as possible, not least because of the challenges which we've already um, stated in terms of what we have to deal with in the period ahead, COVID and Brexit, the, civil service reform, the NDNA commitments, all the things that we have said that we want to deliver upon. So the thing that what we're looking towards is appointing um, an interim um, hawks, um, and we hope to be able to do that. We're working with SIB as we speak to try to be able to do that. Um, oh, I won't come in or stress that time frame, but eminently that we want to be able to bring forward a, an appointment in an interim way. And then we're also now um, looking at and re-looking at the role of hawks and we're looking at governance models elsewhere and how this is done and is there a better way for us to do it and that's all part and parcel of what we're trying to do to design a new process because there'll have to be a, a new process these things can be quite lengthy and that's why we've decided to, to opt for an interim commissioner to help us through the the next short while so it's it's not in the too um far off future but um we don't have a time frame as yet but this committee will be the first to, to know whenever we have that all tied down uh, and just moving on to another issue, um, I was reading, I think it was this morning or yesterday, a survey that has been carried out uh, in a number of European countries in the context of the pandemic. Uh, and over 78% uh, of people surveyed uh, were of the view that coming out of the other side of this pandemic, that there should be fairer and more equal society. And we, we, we've seen here the way the, the virus has disproportionately affected uh, those in, in more deprived areas, and that seems to be a pattern uh, right across the world. So the, the inequalities that already exist are being exacerbated by this. And I'm wonder, wondering if that will have any impact on views on the programme for government in the time ahead. I think that... I, I must have read that myself as well. Um, somewhere where it it said that um, people didn't, when they talk about the new norm, what is the new norm and is there an opportunity for us to do something better and to build something better on the other side of COVID? And I think that is, that is this is, this is our opportunity. I mean, the, the programme for government as a concept before um, going back to whenever we first brought forward uh, um, this new way to do the programme for government where it forced uh, a change in approach from government departments because it moved away from the silo mentality into this collective um, working. I think COVID demonstrates to us all that there's an ability for us to work at speed and for us to be way more agile in, in government. And it also um, has shown us that if we're going to successfully take on the big challenges that we have, whether it's a global pandemic 
whether it's climate change or any of the other significant issues, that if we, if we work together, we'll be far more effective. So I certainly want us to use the opportunity of the, of the new style programme for government for us to refocus our energies and our efforts. Let's try and deliver something better because this is probably a, you know, a once in a lifetime opportunity in order to, to do something differently because of the situation that we find ourselves in. But, uh, Emma, then it will be the two Trevors with Trevor Longford. Thanks, Chair, and thank you both um, for coming in this afternoon. Again, um, I just, I suppose, following on from what you were saying about COVID, I just I think it's important to make the comment, and I know this was said at the very start of the pandemic around, you know, it, it would be great if we all knew what was coming down the, the tracks, but I think people can appreciate that we don't have that foresight, unfortunately, and, you know, we're reacting as best as we can, and I, th I think people are getting that, although there's there's so much mixed opinion about all of this. But I just had some questions around the PFG commitments, <coughs> particularly out of NDNA. So we had passed uh, a motion in the Assembly, I think a fortnight ago now, on the racial equality strategy and calling for that to be um, updated and implemented as per NDNA, and I just wondered where that sat. Well, as you know, um the racial equality strategy includes a commitment that the subgroup will meet three times a year. I'm pleased to say that the subgroup met just yesterday. Um, they've had a very good engagement. We have been um, jointly keeping a very close eye on the work that is going on with the racial equality subgroup um, because it's a very important issue for us. Uh, we want all citizens who live in Northern Ireland to feel a part of Northern Ireland, and that's very important uh, that we continue to say that. Uh, I had a meeting with the African and Caribbean Support Organisation here in Northern Ireland um, just last month to listen to some of their concerns. Um, they were actually supportive of the strategy, but saying that we needed to make sure that it was um, monitored and that there, some of the work on ethnic monitoring, for example, on hate crime legislation, issues such as that was taken forward. Um, and of course, we're waiting on Judge Marnon's report on hate crime legislation. Uh, and when we have that, uh, we will be able to move forward on some of those uh, issues. Uh, they were also saying to me, um, this is the UN decade uh, for people of African descent, and uh, what is it that the executive is doing to help uh, celebrate that? Uh, and I had to say to them that we would come back to them on that issue because it's something that I wasn't aware of uh, and it's something that I've asked officials to look into to see if we can uh, make sure that we do celebrate that. So I think the engagement is good. Um, uh, is there more that we can do? Probably, yes, uh, and that's why I think it's good to have the Assembly and the Executive Office Committee looking at these issues so that we can push forward what is right for those people um, who have come to live here, who have lived here and who are from an ethnic minority background uh, and who want to celebrate the fact that they're as Northern Irish as the rest of us. Yeah, I think you know we're we're halfway through the strategy, and I know that the motion that uh, you have brought to the assembly itself, and that was well um, debated and, and very well contributed to. I think it's our job and political leadership to make our society an inclusive one, where more and more people feel part. And um, I think it's a it's a, a beautiful thing that we have a, a diverse society, and 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 you know, let's hope we see much 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 more of it. And I think that. Um, we in political leadership have to lead by example when it comes to um, saying that the, the, the type of show political leadership in terms of stamping out racism, making sure that we're doing all we can to be as inclusive as we can. And just, I actually also had met the African Caribbean Society, and um, I, I also wasn't aware about the UN decade. And I think um, we both had committed to, to doing something about that, and I've written to the speaker because. Uh, I was aware that something he also was considering. So hopefully there'll be an opportunity to do something meaningful, as opposed to just a, you know, a, a, an event where people are invited in. Maybe just to do something meaningful that actually has got a, a, a significant uh, impact um, for those those individuals. And I think that um, we, we need to look towards implementing in full all the recommendations um, in the strategy, and then obviously we'll be looking towards post this the, the strategy because we're halfway through it. And, and obviously the institutions were down for three years, so I think that um, there's probably a wee sense of feeling there that perhaps that the issue hasn't been given as much attention as it should have, but let's, we're, 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 we can fix that. Perfect, no. Um, the other thing then as well, and I should declare an interest in this, I'm the chair of the Ad Hoc Bill of Rights um, Committee, and so obviously we, as per NDNA, there was a commitment that there would be a panel of experts um, that they are being selected by um, the Executive Office, so I just wondered there was an update on that process and where it was sitting at the minute. 
Yeah, well, we, we as party leaders have met and we're discussing all the NDNA commitments and, you know, making sure we get these things delivered. So um, we will seek to make appointments in terms of the, the experts over the coming weeks and um, hopefully that allows us then to be able to progress this work because it is significant work um, and, you know, commend all those that are on the committee actually take, work on their way through this. Thanks. Thank you, Eva. Um, Trevor? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I was <laughs> Trevor 1 and Trevor 2. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for your answer so far. Um, just on the head of civil service situation, uh, I'd have to say that you know, David Sterling indicated his intention to leave in December. Nine months seems quite a long time, even in the troubled times we live in. But we are where we are, um, and I'm not entitled to know if you both agree that none of the candidates were suitable, so I'm not asking that. But I think you're going to have to put this out to new applications, mm -hmm. start the process effectively over again. Uh, so the first thing would be, can any of the candidates who applied before reapply? And secondly, if you're going to appoint an in interim head of civil service, can I assume that that person will not be eligible to apply for the post? Well, we're working through all of these issues with um, our advisors and our lawyers, uh, to be honest with you, Trevor, because we want to make sure that it's done right, because as we said at the beginning, uh, this is a very important job. It's a leader of 23,000 civil servants. It's someone who is very identified uh, with the executive, and therefore we need them to be someone uh, who both uh, the Deputy First Minister and I, but the whole executive ministers can look to for advice and guidance. Uh, in terms of the period between David deciding he was not, he was going to resign. Um, that actually was started pretty quickly after we came back into office. Um, I think it was one of the first things that was mentioned to us about the process. As I understand it, even in quick time, the process would take six months. Yep. And um, obviously it took to, uh, we did the interviews on the 23rd of September, so essentially it took nine months um, or thereabouts. Um, from the time that we uh, first um, signed off on the sub in January or February, whenever it was, uh, around uh, the head of the civil service. So yes, it does take some considerable time, and that's why we've decided that we need an interim head of the civil service probably for a year. So that gives us the time to ha do all of the work that we need to do to have the new person in place and if they have to give notice in another job or whatever, that they then will be able to start within that period of time. So I think we're very much aware of the importance of this role. Uh, as the Deputy First Minister said, we hope to be able to have that interim hawks in place in the very near future so that they can take matters forward. And the other thing, just uh, I mean, Arlene's right in terms of we need to be careful about just following due process and yeah. we'll work with HR around all this and that's we were guided by HR the whole way through um, the process. Um, but we do now, now that we are, that competition is closed, um, we are moving to appoint an interim, um, but we now are looking, re-looking at the, or the, the process itself um, and what actually that could, might look like. So there are opportunities if you look elsewhere, the head of the civil service here has considered a role to be both Head of the TEO, but also you know head of the service. So we look at we're looking towards other jurisdictions. Is there another way to do that? Okay. And perhaps that maybe then um, will help just <coughs> attract even more candidates to come forward as well. Yeah, well, thanks for that. But I haven't actually answered either of my questions. Uh, can the interim uh, can head of civil service apply for the job first of all, and secondly, can the I think three people who were considered for the job reapply if it was a new, new process. Well, I don't think there's any difficulty in the three people, and actually there were more than three people, of course, Trevor, that applied for the job. Well, those were the I'm last three. You um, down to three. Yeah, those were the last three that were presented to us um, uh, at the final stage. Though there, there was a wide range of people that apply, I can't see why they wouldn't be able to apply. I say that subject to advice from Nick's HR. I can't see why they wouldn't be able to uh, reapply. Uh, and in terms of the interim head of the civil service, I think it is our understanding that that person will not apply for uh, the, the substantive role. I think that would be normal. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, another quick one then, just on uh, COVID, which is obviously very serious. But yeah. I li listened to the health minister the other day in the House, the statement, and he um, referred to the excellent cooperation between four chief medical officers from across the home countries. Yeah. 
He didn't mention the medical officer of the country with which we share Ireland, which is, has a completely porous border. And the, the symmetry between North and South, I would have thought, was well worth consideration. So can you tell me what, what level of cooperation there is between the health authorities and people at your level, North and South? Well, I mean, there's very, very good cooperation. And I mean, uh, I, I mean, it's for Robin to answer the allegation you're making against him, but I can only imagine he was talking about the fact that there are four nations calls which take place on quite a regular basis simply because of the UK. But likewise, there are many, many calls between the Chief Medical Officer uh, in Northern Ireland and the Chief Medical Officer in the Republic of Ireland. I think daily, possibly, uh, calls take place. And I know Robin speaks to Stephen Donnelly on an ongoing basis. Uh, Deputy First Minister and I spoke to the Taoiseach on Monday night um, in relation to the restrictions that were coming in in the Republic of Ireland. So there's very good cooperation and sharing of information, which I think is very important, given what happened in Donegal. Um, I mean, there was, that was a very good piece of working together because we then were able to say to our Chief Medical Officer, Officer, there's a need for him to speak to the Chief Medical Officer in Dublin to see if we can coordinate what's going on in terms of people travelling in and out of Donegal. We were then able to say on Friday that people shouldn't be travelling into Donegal and then of course we had to take our own action in relation to the North West as well. So there's, there's very good cooperation. So the, the, there's a scheduled meeting every Friday between the Chief Medical Officer here and um, Tony Hulhan now, but obviously Ronan Glynn who was mm. acting. And then, obviously, alongside that, there's all the just ad hoc, when, when required um, conversations that are underway. I think there's always room, room for improvement in all these things, such as life. Um, but I think that uh, your point around the virus, how it spreads across the island, doesn't stop because there's different jurisdiction. It just makes common sense um, for us to cooperate in as strong as possible terms. Um, yeah, I've advocated for some time that we need a, an all-island approach, but I've also advocated, in fact, that I think we need... Uh, both islands to have the same approach. I think that would be more beneficial in terms of our approach. So we are aligned in, in, in some things and not in others, and it doesn't always um, stack up, um, in my opinion. Yeah, Chair, I was in Donegal about two months ago, and I was told at that time there hadn't been a case in, in Donegal County for 56 days. And it went from that in a very short mm -hmm. period of time to being the worst in the Republic. Yeah. At the same time as Darian Straban went over the cliff mm -hmm. as well. From being there there, there must be a reason for that, and that's, that's why I stress the point. But I'm reassured by what you said. But that's fair enough. Yeah. Tour, just before I come to to, to you, um, George Martina uh, Kong, are you still hearing this? Yes. Oh. Philip, no, that's, that's fine. Um, uh, I'm going to call it Trevor and, and Martina. If I come to you after Trevor, that's okay. Uh, thanks, Chair. And I suppose f first, I'd like to acknowledge maybe Pat's point in terms of the, the appointment of the Victims Commissioner, a former party colleague of yours, and indeed shared the same constituency with me. And I think we should all wish Danny well in his mm. endeavours. And I think it was a certainly it was a commitment from our parties collectively that we we seen this, and it was in the new decade and new approach document. I, I can understand Pat's frustration, possibly that he may not qualify, but I could point him towards the the older papers. Older people's commissioner in another couple of years. We want to get, if he wants to get very nice, if, 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 <laughs> but, but certainly that's an option if he feels left out in terms of commissioner. Um, all joking aside, um, I, I've listened carefully today in terms of what both the first minister and, and, you, and you've said, deputy first minister. And I think I can understand the scepticism. There is scepticism in terms of the COVID, and we all get that. And you did, I mean, I think you both started off very well during the summer in terms of the messaging, and people were listening to that messaging. And I'm not trying to be controversial today, but the actions of yourself, Deputy First Minister, in terms of some of the things that you were involved in. And I think for many of us, when we can't fix that, but I think if there's a wholesome apology to people, then they could understand that maybe what you have done in terms of your actions has caused the confusion and mixed messaging. Because one thing, I think we're all collective in this, we want to see us all come out the other side of this with as least people affected as possible. And I think to get back to that message, and I think it's important that you are both working the way you did at the start, but I think your actions has affected that message greatly. Indeed, I heard one of your own supporters on the radio this morning saying that very thing. So I'm not saying that as a unionist. I'm saying your own supporters are saying the mixed message is because of your actions. But do you see at any time in the future that you will 
uh, change our opinion on that and actually apologise for your actions to try and get us back on track to get the, the outcomes that I know both of you want, but to try and get that message back to, to the people that they can actually understand that you were sorry for what you've done. Well, well, firstly, can I say, Trevor, we've never stopped working together. We've continued to work our way the whole way through this pandemic from start. From the very start when we first were, were alarmed and started to see the pandemic uh, come, upon, uh, come upon us. And the whole way through that process, we have worked day and night. Uh, quite often we've been joking about being in each other's bubble because we've had to work so closely, uh, both as joint first ministers, but as an executive as a whole. Uh, my commitment to the public the whole way through this is, is unquestionable. I think that um, I have answered this question that you have raised again today at previous committee meetings, maybe on maybe one or maybe two, three occasions. Um, I've been before the Assembly Chamber. I've spoken to um, all MLA's queries and questions. I have said publicly that I regret if the public health message was in any way jeopardised. I've said that. That's on the record. So I think what's important is that we focus on where we are today. My, I've, I've said my piece. I think it's important that we focus on where we are here and now. And where we are here and now is in a very difficult position. Where we are in the here and now is where we have increased numbers of people in hospital, increased positive cases, and we're going in the wrong direction. What we have to focus on today, all of us in political leadership, is actually getting us through this next period, getting us through the winter months, which, you know, I don't need to paint for you how difficult this is going to be. And we have tough decisions to take, and I have a job to do, and I'm determined to do that job. And I appreciate what you've said, and I appreciate the work you've done, and I can see the work you've done. But what I'm saying is, I suppose it's the messaging, where on one, where on one hand, you're telling people to do one thing, and you're saying to do another. I accept what you have said, and I'm happy to move on with that at the minute. In relation to the figures then, uh, and it's interesting in terms of you're saying about the accurate figures, or you're both saying about the figures that you're getting from the scientists. And I suppose, again, the scepticisms out there are saying that other scientists are saying different things. But in relation to those figures, and I hear what you've both said today in terms of the numbers rising, and I think we are all genuinely worried of that. I mean, I, I was shielding over the, the summer months, and it, it was particularly strange for someone who's out all the time to be confined to the house. But, but I think there is a degree of fear. I mean, there's no doubt of that. There's fear right across the community in terms of the direction that's travelling. But, but what alarms me even more, when, whenever you say that you are continually alarmed on every occasion, given that you have an insight to the figures... Would you say, in relation to the figures that you've been presented on each of those occasions, and the trajectory of what the scientists are saying has been accurate? Well, I think in terms of the data of positive cases, yes. I, uh, obviously, the hospitalisations are accurate because they are just a reflection of the factual position in our hospitals at that time. Uh, we can look across uh, the hospitals and see how many uh, vacant beds there are, for example. Um, you will remember when we started all of this back uh, at the end of February, March time, we had uh, the objectives of trying to push the curve down so that our NHS wasn't overwhelmed. We still want that to be the case. And when we're coming into winter, we're acutely aware of that because we know that there are other diseases and viruses out there. Um, of course, the flu is out there, the winter flu. Uh, and we know that hospital space will become very tight. Um, so the health minister will be looking at whether he needs to take action in respect of that in terms of standing up a Nightingale Hospital, whether he needs to stop elective surgery. And I listened very carefully uh, to what some of the surgeons were saying about that just yesterday. Um, look, this is a very, I've called it a tightrope, but it is a tightrope. Because not only is it a tightrope in terms of economic and societal impacts, but also non-COVID health care. And you and I know that in terms of cancers, there are in particular, and indeed many other uh, issues as well, and, and we've all received letters about people who haven't been getting their treatments and who haven't been able to get surgery. I mean, that is a huge issue as well, Trevor, that we have to take into consideration because we want to make sure that those people who are red flag cancer diagnosis get the care that they need and get the attention that they need. But in order to do that, we have to make sure that the hospitals aren't overwhelmed with numbers. Um, so it is all of those things that we have to take into consideration. And sometimes when I listen to some of the sceptics, and they're absolutely entitled to be sceptical, <laughs> that's absolutely the case, but they don't have all of the information. Do you know what I mean? And when we're looking at all of the information in terms of the economy, in terms of isolation and mental health issues, in terms of cancer diagnosis, in terms of COVID diagnosis, that's all of the information that we have to look at. And that's a big job of work to do. And I suppose the other question I want, um, in relation to response, I think it was the, one of the junior first ministers 
in response yesterday had said um, to a question about where is the end of this? Mm. And, and the answer was the vaccine. Mm. And is that, the, is that the real end end goal? I mean, do we see any other option other than the vaccine? And is the vaccine going to be mandatory? You have to, you have, you have to remember, none of us have been through this before, you know, globally. People mm-hmm. haven't been through this. Mm-hmm. Um, so clearly, if you point to what's the things that allows us to live with the virus, so that is, you know, improved testing. That means an excellent first-class contact tracing system. You know, so there's advancements in testing all the time. So how quickly can you get to the rapid tests? You know, so you can turn it around very quickly so people can, if they have symptoms, get tested and then get back out into everyday life. So I think there's a combination of things that will allow us to get to that point or allow us to live with the virus. The vaccine is ultimately where you want to get to. Um, but I don't think in any society where, you know, making something mandatory is, is not always something that's going to um, be welcome and be received and people have all sorts of concerns so um, no I think that you have to get to the point where we learn to live with the virus that's ultimately where, we, where we're trying to get to because none of us know what the end point is um, but when you have a vaccine then that's clearly a game changer and, and we don't even have a you know a time frame as such as yet around that because obviously there's global demand for a vaccine and then once you have the vaccine then you'll have to look at Target and who gets it first, you know, who's most in need, and then you know the whole rollout program as well. Okay. Well, I wish you well both in the endeavours in terms of what you've been doing because I'm sure it has been difficult for you all summer in relation to that. In response, I think to Doug's question about, I mean, obviously the the very heavy workload we're going to have between now and the end of this mandate. Um, and I know First Minister, you had said yes, these things will be done. Are we are we saying those will be done with full scrutiny of the committee, and we won't be looking at any accelerated passages in relation to particularly the language stuff? Well, those are issues that we will discuss with the committee. Um, as I said, we haven't had the opportunity to discuss this at executive level yet, so we have to bring those to the executive. Okay. Well, thank you, Martina. Thank you. Thank you both for for the presentation, and once again being in front of us today. Um, I'm extremely worried about my own constituency of Derry and the council area, Derry and Stabane. As Trevor has said, you know, end of June, July, you know, most of August, uh, we went through a situation where we had no COVID cases at all uh, being reported here in the city. And today, when I looked at those figures over the last seven days of 959, nearly a thousand cases, and the rate being at 636, it's absolutely alarming. And I think that um, the message is actually being heard that we are the host and we are the carriers. And whilst people may have dropped their guard because, you know, June, July, August, you know, people felt that we had tackled it and thought and maybe hoped that it would be, uh, that it was gone. But I remember during May discussing with both of you how we were worried uh, engaging with carers and agency workers and those low paid. And this is soft intelligence. There, there's nothing you know academic about it, but just to, to ask you to find that there are carers that are worried that if they have to self-isolate, that the statutory sick pay, that the health minister, the 11.5, million, I think it was given to the independent sector, that that's running out apparently uh, in a few weeks' time. But there's some agency workers and there's some low-paid workers who can't afford to self-isolate. And that's obviously a problem across Derry and Straban. So if it was possible for you to comment on, on any of that, because I know you've had in the past been deeply concerned about those low-paid workers and the implication that COVID was having on them in the first wave. And it's the same thing now. And it may be contributing, it's not the cause, but it's contributing perhaps to the spread of this deadly virus across our constituency. Well, I think um, we hear what you're saying. And I actually think that just in the answer to the previous question around the only way we're going to be effective and start to come out of this if we have an excellent um, fine test, trace and protect an isolate system in place and if, if you have a situation where people um, just because of their need to survive um, aren't able to um, isolate or choose not to even though they perhaps have symptoms or 
you know, find themselves in that scenario is not a desperate indictment on us all that that's, that's the case. So I think we we'll have to continually look at um, supporting people. We have limited um, financial um, levers open to us as an executive to be able to support people and that's why we've been making the call um, over and Connor Murphy as the finance minister and Diane Dodds as the economy minister and ourselves as an executive as a whole have made the case to the Treasury that in order for us to be able to deal with the pandemic and respond in the way in which we need to based on the, the public health advice, then we need that financial support package in order for us to be able to support um, people to do to, to manage to get through this. So that's the case that we're continuing to make and we hope to make progress on it. Um, we don't have anything more than that to say on, on it today, but just certainly be assured that we are right in the corner um, to, to get what we need to try and respond to the, the pandemic and to support people. I think we all saw throughout the whole of the pandemic that the people that we relied on depended on, and I think I did say this before at this committee, were the people to keep our, our shelves stacked and the people in their... Um, in our shops and the, the, the care workers that worked in the nursing homes and you know the domiciliary care workers, all those people that we depended on very much. So when they are traditionally a probably a female workforce and also traditionally the lowest paid in society. So I think that that begs a question around the point that Pat made earlier around what type of society do we want to live in? And I think that's the a, a bigger fundamental question for us going forward. So, so just two things to add there. Um, Martina, you will know that um, the Finance Minister has announced a support package today for the hospitality uh, sector. Um, that comes out of our block grant, um, and we committed to do that. And indeed, if any other area has to have similar restrictions, we will do the same again. So, you know, it, it is a big commitment from us, but we absolutely recognise the need uh, to help those businesses at this time. Secondly, there was conversations around a £500 payment um, in England for those who had to self-isolate and were trying to bottom out. Um, is that a payment that's going to come across to us on a Barna Consequential, or will it be demand-led for people who do have to self-isolate and then are able to access that? So I think uh, the Finance Minister is trying to get answers in relation to that issue, but you're absolutely right. If people feel that they're going to lose out financially by having to self-isolate, then that is a disincentive, um, and that is something that has been raised by ourselves um, during our quadrilateral meetings with Westminster and indeed by Scotland and Wales, so it's an ongoing issue that we continue to raise. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, can I ask, you'll not be surprised, I'm going to ask you a question about Brexit. Uh, you both had mentioned uh, negotiations and round nine. What's your assessment of where things are at by way of possibly getting a deal um, before the end of this year when we could crash out? Well, um, unfortunately, <laughs> I don't know if I'd wager a bet on that one right now. It doesn't, it doesn't um, bode well, I think, that we are here at this stage very closely actually coming up to the date that Boris Johnson himself put on, that if there's no deal by the 15th, like you said, of, of October, then there wouldn't be one. Um, there are, however, intense negotiations um, going on as we speak, I believe, in Brussels. And um, if they go into this, so they're in this ninth round of negotiations, and if there is progress and they are able to go into a tunnel, um, it still is yet to be seen. Um, what we need, our principal point in the middle of it all, is that we need to see clarity. Um, we need to see clarity uh, either way, um, even if a deal is achieved. I mean, I think that we are, because we've such a short period, um, in order to be able to respond to that and actually be ready, um, it puts us, puts us in a very difficult um, situation. But um, we need clarity and we need to be able to plan. We need um, certainty for business community and we need um, the protections that were afforded to us and the protocol implemented in full. So I'm slightly more positive than that, Martina, as you expect me to be. Um, I think we will um, get a deal by the end of the year. We may not get it by the deadline of the, uh, the council meeting, which I think is next week, uh, if I'm right. Um, but I think, as with all negotiations, and those of us in this room are very well <laughs> versed in negotiations and how they run, um, I think as we move towards the end of the year, uh, there is very much a realisation that for all sides we need to get uh, an agreement. Um, what that agreement will look like, um, I am not so sure about, but I think we will get there. One last question. Um, obviously, um, at the Assembly, at, I think it was Tuesday, we had a vote, and the overwhelming majority of the members voted that 
the British government has broken international law. So we're worried, uh, some of us anyway are worried about the, uh, the protocol, the Irish protocol and the implementation of that. So when's the next meeting? Uh, do we have a date for the next joint committee meeting just to ensure the protection of the protocol is upheld? I'm not sure what the date is for the 9th of October, perhaps, um, and where we um, sit on the meeting, obviously, and it's the, the British government and the EU side are, are, in, are in the room. Um, we have an opportunity at that stage to be able to, to seek an update, but clearly the EU have been very firm in saying that there is no role or remit or um, opportunity for, any, for the British government to break international law, and it just flies in the face of... Of of of, um, of of anything that's right in the democratic process to, to actually say that you're going to break an international law, a law that you yourself actually, or break the protocol that you yourself signed up to. So I think the, the EU have a very strong opinion on that. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to say to both of you, despite our differences at times, you're doing remarkable, in my opinion. Thank you, uh, Martina. If I call Christopher and then George will finish off after you. So, Christopher. Uh, yes, the, the EU, a rules based organisation that consistently rips up its own rules when it chooses to, but we'll just step over that. Um, in the new decade, new approach, there was a commitment given to uh, a review of arm's length bodies and quangos, and the First Minister will know uh, the wording uh, in that is with a view to rationalisation, because she will recall that I was very keen that we should have that wording included. Various drafts kept coming back with that sentence missing and had to be put back in. Um, where's that at? Well, as I understand it, the Finance Minister is leading on that uh, piece of work. I don't have an update in relation to that, but it certainly started. OK. Um, and uh, maybe, Chair, we can get an update for the committee in relation to where that sits at present. Yeah, I believe the work is underway and, yeah. and hopefully we'll be able to give an update at some stage very shortly. Yeah. OK. Um, we now, not wanting to sound a bit like sort of Donald Rumsfeld about known knowns and unknown yes. knowns, but we, we now know certain things that we didn't know at the start of the outbreak of COVID. One of the things that we now know, and figures released by the CDC in America have demonstrated this, compared to an 18 to 29-year-old, Someone who's 75 to 84 is 220 times more likely to die of COVID. Someone that's 85 plus is 630 times more likely to die than an 18 to 29 year old. <coughs> Same age bracket, 18 to 29, a 75 to 84 year old is eight times more likely to be hospitalised. And an 85 year old is 13 times more likely to be hospitalised. Given that we now know, these are now known mm. knowns uh, that we didn't have at the start of that. Will that information like that be shaping potential responses to a worsening situation? Of course, we have to take into consideration that the, the, even if you look at our own figures here in Northern Ireland and the, the age group that suffered disproportionately, we know very well is the over 65s. Mm -hmm. we, we are, of course, aware of that. But as I said, I think in response to Trevor, there's um, the other issue of long COVID, which does concern us, it's perhaps known about, but not fully mm. as yet, the implications of if you suffer from COVID and then it continues to have an impact on your life. So that isn't really a statistic we have, Christopher, mm. at present, because we don't know how many people are suffering from long COVID. So I think that that is something that we have to consider as well. But yes, absolutely. We, we know uh, that, um, and we've known maybe from quite early on, that this was a disease that targeted older people uh, and people who were vulnerable and had underlying conditions. So that is something that we know, uh, and therefore it's something that we do take into consideration. Um, and probably one of the reasons why we say it's so important that our schools stay open uh, and that our young people who have already missed out on some chances because of COVID, and we all remember what happened in the summer with A-level and GCSE results and all of that, we need to be able to allow these young people to sit their exams next year uh, and to continue with their education and continue with their life chances because that's very important. I think actually in terms of people at a disadvantage, the kids that are sitting their A-levels in GCSE yes. this year yeah, are absolutely. actually at more of a disadvantage because I agree. of the sheer amount of time schooling that they have yeah. lost. The reason I ask it is because um, I'm concerned that we may be using a, uh, I don't want to say a sledgehammer to crack a nut, but the pattern 
appears to have been established is there's a rise in cases, we go into a lockdown, the cases <coughs> fall, we ease the lockdown, and the cases start to rise again. And I just have a concern that if we keep doing that, I think it was um, someone said in the assembly, you know, when do we get off that merry-go-round? Mm -hmm. So I'm just mindful of the fact as well that the assembly yesterday passed a motion asking for the economy minister and the finance minister to produce a financial package. I mean, we're now running at a situation where UK, the UK national deficit has risen from 2.4 to 13.9 per cent, and the national debt is above 100 per cent of GDP for the first time since the 1960s. Mm -hmm. It's easy to pass a motion in the Assembly saying the, the economy minister and the finance minister need to produce money. Where's it going to come from? Well, it's back to the money tree uh, <laughs> again. And I mean, we've always had the difficulty because we're a devolved administration that we have to work within our block grant. Yes. Um, and as I've said, in relation to what we're doing up in the northwest, uh, the interventions that we're making there, uh, which we hope will be helpful, they won't solve all of the problems for those businesses. And we recognise that. Um, but we hope that will be helpful. But that has to come out of our block grant. And that's why we are very much saying to the Prime Minister uh, and to Michael Gove, the CDL, that we need to have an assessment because furlough is coming to an end at the end of October. If the country does have to go into stricter restrictions, what is it that Westminster is going to do to help, whether it's Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland or England? Because we simply don't have the wherewithal to intervene for the whole of the economy. We don't have it. I think that's important that the people take cognizance of that fact. As I say, it's one thing to stand up in the Assembly Chamber on a Tuesday at plenary and say something must be done when you don't actually have any costings attached to mm. what the something that you want done is. Can I ask, uh, can I say, firstly, I'm very pleased that uh, the Commissioner for Survivors uh, of Institutional Abuse has been appointed. There may obviously be some disagreement in terms of what a memorial will look like. Some people may want a window or, or a statue. And, I happen to be of the view that I think a living memorial would be a more benefit something for disadvantaged children to bring them on in life, maybe education or something like that. But has there been any consideration given to what the memorial might look like? It's something that we have to be very careful and, and very much co-design, co co you know, yeah. because um, you have your view of what you think is important yes, and, and others may have a different view. But at the heart of everything and everything we do around either the memorial or the apology, has to be the wishes of the victims and survivors. So I believe that some work has been done on that, but again, we, we'll be meeting with um, the interim advocate in um, in a few weeks' time, and these are the things that we're going to be talking about. Um, but I, I would I would imagine um, that Ms Ryan and her new post, will, this will be something that she'd want to pick up very quickly, and I have no doubt that um, she'll want to seek views and, and learn for herself exactly what is the best way forward. But you know, we'll all have an opinion, um, yeah. and, and will we satisfy everybody all the time? Probably not, but we'll try our very best to get the best consensus that we have, that we could get, you know, to, to, to find what is the most fitting memorial. I think just one final question. The, the role that uh, you both have, obviously, is a cross-cutting role across uh, all of government. Um, I'm given to understand that the Minister for Infrastructure was warned in July that there could be up to 23,000 people uh, waiting for a driving test, and that additional provision was going to be required for that. Uh, there have been thousands of people in a queue online, the NI Direct. There have been thousands of people in a queue online waiting to book a driving test since Sunday. And today, a spokesperson for that particular department said they are now considering securing additional examinations. Could I just ask you, as you have done before, in terms of the remit of the Department for Infrastructure, to take a direct interest in this matter and try to pursue some sort of a resolution because there seems to have been a bit of dithering in terms of getting to grips with this because people need their driving tests. Absolutely, and a lot of young people, and you know mm -hmm. how it's a come of age experience in your life when you soon as you. I waited until I was 27 because I live in Belfast. Oh, you were uh, you were <laughs> Belfast. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I, well, you live in the country, you say as soon as you're the age to drive, you want to get your driving test. Um, so we know how important it is to young people, and um, we have an executive meeting tomorrow, so we'll pick that up. Thank you. Yeah, it disproportionately hits young people again, as we've been talking throughout this executive meeting. So it's certainly something, it's something that we have been talking about at the executive, but certainly happy to raise the issue again. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, George? 
And um, back in the end, the, the both ministers for the excellent work that they are doing, and particularly has been doing over the last few months, I mean, it hasn't been easy, I'm sure. A um, couple of questions, um, and I'm not trying to be controversial, but now that we seem to be in the second, in the second wave, what measures are the executive considering to address transmission due to the large numbers of people gathering at social sporting events, and such as we witnessed there, particularly with those GAA matches in the recent past. Uh, I mean, there's no evidence of social distancing or, or anything. I mean, as I said earlier, now that um, we're in the second wave, I mean, all that need, needs to stop. We, we, need, we need to be a lot more conscious of what, what we're doing and how we're behaving. And the second issue that I'd like to bring to both ministers is that, um, and it's more from the ordinary man on the street, um, at the weekends, there's, from the PHA's point of view, public health agency, you ring up there and there's no, nobody on at the weekend. The 111 number is very, very hard to get at the weekend as well. And it may not be your remit, but could something be done about it? That's my questions. <laughs> Thanks, George. Um, we can pick up the issue of the PHA and, and no one at the weekend. I, I actually also heard the same um, into my constituency office where people were saying actually that they needed some advice and they couldn't get it. So maybe we need to <coughs> ask, ask the health minister to look at that. Uh, no doubt the PHA are under huge pressure, to, to be fair, um, but, but let, us, let us take that, that on board. Can I say when it comes to the GAA, the GAA were exemplary, uh, you know, at the very start of this pandemic, they were the first, first organisation to actually um, shut things down. And I, I'm very much from a GAA um, family and community, and the, the GAA have actually really assisted um, the communities that they, you know, they come from the whole way through this pandemic. They've been absolutely first class. They've led from the front when it came to looking after the most vulnerable. Um, I commend them again this week on their on their action to to shut down all club activity um, because of the fears that you know we're the difficult position that we find ourselves in again. So I commend them for the work that they that they have done, uh, and I and I welcome the words from the Ulster Council um, over this week and, and on previous weeks. So I think that um, we are into a very challenging period in the time ahead, and whether it be you know GAA soccer, any of the sporting codes, whether it be any kind of gatherings at all, it's just going to be um, challenging for everybody. So we all have our part to play. The GAA are playing their part again. So George. Um I had raised this issue uh, with Brian McAvoy, who is um, president of the, well, he might, he might be the chief executive of the Ulster GAA, because I was concerned after what happened at the Tyrone County final and what happened in Dungannon on that occasion. And look, I recognise that it was 64 years since Dungannon had won the uh, Tyrone County final, and it was a big moment for them. But unfortunately now, and Brian has acknowledged this um, himself, uh, we're now seeing cases in and around that area happening, um, probably as a result of what happened on that occasion. So I do welcome the fact that the GAA have decided to um, cancel um, those games. I think that's the right thing to do. I had um, a conversation with the Communities Minister this morning about some of these issues. Um, on the other side of this, we recognise that a lot of um, local football clubs, a lot of local hockey clubs, rugby clubs and what have you, um, rely on gate receipts um, to be viable. And because they don't have any spectators, um, they are in big difficulties at the moment. And you will know that from a, a, an Irish League football point of view, George, and uh, it's something that you've raised with me before. Um, so uh, the Communities Minister is looking at all of that. I think she's working with all of the sporting organisations to see what it is that she can do to help, uh, whether that's guidance or financial support. So um, it's something that we're very aware of. Uh, we know that when people go to support their team that, that they want to do it in an exuberant way. Um, we understand that. But we have to try and protect people, uh, and that's why 
I think it's right that we do take those socially distanced measures. When uh, Ulster Rugby, for example, on Friday night, I think did it very well in terms of their pilot. Um, and I know that they are working with the Communities Minister on that uh, around bringing spectators in and what have you. So it is something that we're keeping an eye on, George. Um, um, but you're right uh, to raise the issue uh, around some of the matches that have taken place. Maybe just to supplementary on that, uh, First Minister, uh, the Irish League starts next Saturday, Saturday week, 17th. Yeah. And um, spectator wise, is there any any talk yet as to how they're going to cope with, with that situation? Well, th that's what we were talking to the Communities Minister about, George, uh, because she's very much aware uh, of the fact that a lot of these small local clubs rely on people coming to see the game and paying um, to get in. Um, so that'll not make them viable. So she's looking at that at the moment, and no <coughs> doubt she'll come back uh, with some solutions around that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um George, uh, can I ask a, a, a last question, Deputy First Minister, briefly? And I only ask it because there is considerable public interest around this. But have you been interviewed by the police yet in regards to the Bobby story um, funeral? No. Okay. Good enough. Um, uh, Mr. thank you very much for, for your time. You've been very generous with your time, uh, and, and there was a fair range of, of questions there. Um, and I, I think you gave some really good answers and gave us a better understanding. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Chair. Bye-bye. Okay, members, thank you for that. I, I, I thought there were some, some really good questions there um, uh, and some good answers. I think it, it helped us. Uh, I'm just going to suspend sitting for five minutes just to allow you the place to be clean, just ready for uh, the next um, set of oral evidence. Thank you. Assembly, committee room, Northern Ireland Assembly, committee room 30. Hello. 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 Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, members, we're, uh, item five is the Common Framework Departmental Oral Evidence Session. Uh, if I can refer members to page 17 of the meeting pack and page 7 uh, of the table pack, advise members, uh, officials are in attendance today to provide an update on the Common Framework. Um, so I'd first of all like to welcome uh, Andrew McCormick, the General Director of International Relations of the Executive Office, uh, Lorraine Linus, um, EU Future Relations Division of the Executive Office, uh, and Michael Williamson, just at the back, um, mm -hmm. uh, the Common Framework uh, Programme for the Executive Office. And if I could advise them, uh, this session is being recorded by Hansard and the transcript will be published on the committee uh, website. Um, I welcome you all here uh, again. It's, it's, it's good to have you here. I mean, it's fundamental information that, that we need to be able to do uh, our job. Um, so thank you very much for coming on. Uh, and Andrew, I'll, I'll hand over to yourself. Thanks so much, uh, Deputy Chair, and uh, I'll keep, give this opening brief and allow you to, to get into what, any areas you want to probe in more detail. Uh, so the um, work's been progressing on common frameworks. The project began a long, a long time ago, it, you know, soon after the um, referendum. But the eighth uh, Withdrawal Act and Common Framework Statutory Report was, was published on the 24th of September. <coughs> That's not the most recent analysis of progress. So there are 50, 40 frameworks actively being worked on at the present time that are related to relate here. Uh, 22, um, where a non-legislative framework such as an MOU may be required. 18, uh, where the, the advice is that a, a legislative framework may be required. Um, so that that's there were there were a further um, 115 policy areas identified in 2018 as potentially requiring a common framework arrangement, but they've been. Um, we classified as not requiring further action because there are, already are sufficient uh, working arrangements among the four uh, four jurisdictions. So the, the 40, I think, are set out in the briefing paper. Um, particular progress being made on, on a few of them. It, it has been a bit held up. <coughs> the, the work, having to, a lot of staff who worked on these issues had to be redeployed to COVID work um, across all four 
uh, jurisdictions. Uh, so I think that's, that's understandable. Uh, the, the, the briefing paper has set out the five that are potentially implementable before the end of the transition period. That's hazardous substances planning, uh, nutrition labelling, composition and standards, emissions trading scheme, uh, food and feed safety and hygiene, and radioactive substances. So those are our previously advised on the, on the, on the lists and as, as they were regarded, and there's several more who, which were regarded as essential. Uh, there's, um, on, four, on the first four of those, uh, the fifth may no longer be implementable in the, in the timetable, but that's just being kept under review among the four jurisdictions with Cabinet Office in the lead. Um, the hazardous substances planning and nutrition, they received provisional confirmation at a meeting of JMCEN on the 3rd of September. So they, they will then be submitted to the relevant assembly committee um, with a view to formal confirmation. So that's that's the, the, the next stage of process. So there's a lot of a lot of interaction between this work and the other areas of work, such as the negotiations, the work on uh, UKIM, and the outworkings of the protocol. And, and we're just keeping you know, the team, uh, Ray and Michael and others in the team, work closely with. Uh, cabinet office and the other jurisdictions to make sure this is all being worked out, especially uh, with some of the key areas of work, such as um, <coughs> the issue of un unfettered access from NI to GB as, as part of the, the outcome of the negotiations. Uh, so work, development of those frameworks that are not considered implementable by the end of the year, that work's continuing, and we're keeping that work under review. Uh, and also engaging with stakeholders where, where that's, that's necessary and appropriate. And again, there'll be further progress reports considered by JMCEN um, between now and then. Um, the monitoring of the project is handled by a, a project board, which has representatives of uh, our, our team and executive office, cabinet office, and the Scottish and Welsh governments. At senior official level, that meets, meets monthly, at least monthly. And then there are subgroups dealing with the more detailed aspects uh, so, um, within our system, um, we chair, uh, through Lorraine, the NICS Common Frameworks Forum, um, and that identifies any, makes sure progress is being made and looks for any, any blockages or barriers and tries to overcome those and make sure that the progress is being made in order to get you know, workable, practical arrangements for all these areas of policy work. Uh, once the transition period comes to an end, so that we get get as smooth a, uh, an outcome as possible, and keep ministers informed of progress, uh, make sure that, that where completion isn't possible, at least effective interim arrangements are in place. So that that's all um, pro progressing. Uh, it's trying to keep a, keep the the policy areas manageable, uh, given that there's a very substantial body of, of responsibility that comes back. Uh, as a result of, of EU exit. I'm sure there is anything to add before we go into questions? No, happy enough to take questions, I think, on the, okay. on the programme itself. Okay. Well, listen, um, th thank you, Andrew. I mean, it's, it can be a complicated area and it can be a little dry at times, and I, and I get that. It's just, just a fact of the way, the way it is. But can I just ask, because the Common Framework uh, allows for intra-UK policy divergence, um, you know, if, if there... <coughs> What mechanisms are in place for any divergence intra UK that it doesn't affect the, 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 another portion of, of, of the nation? So if we diverge slightly here in Northern Ireland, what, you know, what mechanisms are in place to make sure that any divergence we have doesn't affect um, one of the other um, uh, constituent yeah, so areas? Is, I, think, I think the key word is framework. It's, it's not a, not a, a rigid common policy, but it's a framework for policy. But do you want to expand yeah. on that? Uh, yes, just to say that uh, within each of the policy areas, that's what the framework is designed to do. It's to look at existing processes that might already have been there. So if you take areas such as fisheries, um, there would have been already very good uh, mechanisms across the four areas of the UK in terms of how they engage with each other through a memorandum of understanding or concordats, which allows that little bit of flex within that sort of structure. 
So the point of the common frameworks is to look within each of those policy areas where there was already existing structures and how you could use those and where there weren't existing structures, what needed to be put in place to strengthen that to allow that little bit of, of, of you know, the, how the, the four nations would work together on that. So, I mean, fisheries would probably be one of the better examples of where the nations had worked together, and there are other examples of that as well, but there might be other policy frameworks where that, that wasn't clearly as, uh, as, you know, the arrangements there weren't as good as they could have been. And, and, I, and I guess when I look at that, that, that framework and, and the fisheries, and I look at the fisheries, and, and they're trying to come up with, with, with how they intend to, to, to work, and, and you know, that, that, that common framework... <clears throat> But are they then stuck slightly that they can't put stuff in place until we see the outworkings of the protocol and the internal market? Um, Bill, is there, is there a circular thing here where one's stuck until one moves and the other one can't move until the first makes a decision? Is that, is that? Well, I think that that is reflected in the delivery of the programme because while it, it sort of moved through the various stages that it needed to, it was then recognised that the internal market was was identified early on as a cost a cross cutting issue that uh, some of the frameworks and it was taken outside of the frameworks then so Bayes and HMT set up a separate group in 2019 to look at the common mar uh, to look at the internal market in particular and how it impacted on the frameworks but you're right to mention those other issues because. Uh, all of the, a lot of the frameworks will be impacted on the scope of the or what, what the outworkings will be from the negotiations with the EU. So what any deal will look like, uh, also the implementation of the protocol. So those were the issues that started to affect the delivery and slow down the development of some of the frameworks until we until we get some of that clarity, which is why the frameworks program had to be sort of amended and adapted as we went through. Um, but it is like everything in EU exit, uh, all of these things are interlinked and until at the final end when the pieces come together, it, it's only then that you can, you can finalise these. Some, some frameworks more than some others. Some frameworks so more than others, very, those that are very, impacted on the protocol uh, obviously. Um, use of difficulty. Yeah, it is. Listen, um, thank you. I'm just going to bring in um, Colin now, if I, if I can, before I open up to, to uh, questions. Colin? Oh, okay, thank, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, yeah, I think as the chair has pointed out, it's a bit complicated and, and a bit dry trying to work out the sort of details uh, of, of the common frameworks. And somehow or another, I kind of have in my head like a Venn diagram where the protocol is one circle, the internal market bill is another circle, and that little bit that's caught in between is us here in the north. And I suppose maybe the first question is, what will happen if we have a conflict between um, the internal market bill and the, the protocol, I mean, is that on somebody's desk to iron out or do we come to the 1st of January and people just, businesses and, and commerce and, and, and people are left looking in two directions, not knowing which one to, to go to? I think the, the process has to be one that resolves as much as possible well before the 1st of January. And uh, I mean, part of what has been said from London is that some of the controversial aspects of the bill, uh, you know, don't are, will only be relevant. They're, they're described described as a safety net. So, uh, if if progress is made in the negotiations to resolve some of the difficult issues, then some of the more controversial proposals wouldn't be needed. So, I think that that's 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 the so the, the solution. The best way to avoid the hazard you're describing there, Chair, is is is, is to get. Um, resolution in the discussion in the discussions, so that that means the the main negotiations. So a good outcome uh, to the, the main negotiations, a free trade agreement, would take away a lot of the pressure. Would remove the issues around. Uh, would remove some of the issues around um, movement of goods, GB to NI. There's still be, there'll still be some checks required, obviously, on the SPS front, but on the on the tariff issue, it would be much reduced. Still need to watch out for non uh, non tariff barriers, technical barriers to trade. All of those things need to be looked at in detail to work out precisely how it works. But but that would avoid some of the things that are are most difficult in the bill, uh, and and therefore so so it, yeah, the the way is, is to yes yes I think uh, the, the Venn diagrams probably got several more you know shapes circles 
uh, ellipses on it, uh, multiple overlaps, multiple interactions. Uh, that, that's, but it's, it's, a, it's a good metaphor in terms of s seeing how, how the, this, this complicated work proceeds. But what we need to do is, is make progress in the negotiations and, and therefore avoid as many of the problems as possible. But maybe if then, I suppose really, um, and this might have been where it, it would have been good to have had your presentation maybe before the first and deputy first minister, because the, it just highlights again the, the critical importance that there is, A, on actually getting a resolution to these matters, and B, the very perilous situation that we're going to be in if there is no deal. Because at this stage, we were told by Boris Johnson it was going to be the 15th of October that was his deadline. That looks likely that it's going to get pushed back to the beginning of November. And you know, it's unlikely that we're going to have a deal that's going to cover everything. And we're going to be left here in, in, in Northern Ireland society with about six weeks to try and assimilate in um, all of the decisions that will be taken in early to mid-November. And the bottom line is that it's going to create chaos whenever it comes to January. Um, and, and then we're going to be trying to do catch up to try and implement uh, common frameworks or internal bills or, you know, they're all going to be scrambled to try and adjust. And it just means that we're heading for a car crash of an exit in whatever shape it is. And everybody seems to just have their fingers crossed that there'll be a good outcome from the negotiations. So um, it's not a great situation to be in. And I appreciate that you're just doing the, the, the work in the background. That's certainly not your fault. but. You know, you're just reminding um, me again of the perilous situation that we're in. Well, I, I think a lot of people are doing a lot more than hoping or keeping fingers crossed. There's a lot of detailed preparatory work being done. I uh, covered a fair bit of this last week. Uh, there's, there's project after project to across all the departments, uh, and we in, in the executive office are, are drawing that together through the inter Interdepartmental Working Group we talked about last week. That, that's, that's the process, and it's designed to identify where, uh, what, what are the biggest risk areas, where are the other things where businesses or citizens uh, or society might be adversely affected, especially bearing in mind that this is you know, going to coincide with the difficulties through the winter as a result of the virus. So looking at, at what would be a, a particularly challenging combination of events and saying, well, well, in that context, where do we need to deploy resources? Where do we need to intervene most? What, how do we manage this most? That's, that's, that is brought to the executive. Uh, we, we look at it as officials. Uh, the, the apparatus is there to, to, to draw those threads together. Yes, there are a lot of things that are still uncertain, but as those become clearer and when we know where we stand, then business guidance, so there's a lot of engagement with businesses. They have a lot of questions. Uh, you know, they, I know from the, the, the business working group that has, has, has been here with you before, uh, and they've done excellent work in analysing and presenting the issues that they're facing. They, they have big concerns, but the, the, we have to get through this step by step, methodically identifying what needs to be done and getting on and doing it. OK, and just then finally, very, very short, uh, quickly, Andrew, um, whenever you mention there that there's a lot of work going on, is that work highlighting what the problems are, or is it highlighting the problems and putting them alongside it a solution so that if that problem isn't sorted by the 31st of December, then in the next column, nearly to that, that there's a solution that can be implemented and whilst it may take a, a week, a month, whatever, to implement that, but where you're identifying problems, you're identifying solutions, or are you just identifying problems? No, we're identifying solutions, identifying what to do. It, it, so it's, it's complicated because you have to allow for a range of scenarios. So th that's why uh, I, you know, the, the publicised reasonable worst case scenario is one we focus on. We also, there's also a central case. You know, you've got to look at those and, and you know, recognising mm -hmm. a degree of uncertainty, say, well, uh, you, know, plan, you know, it's hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Be ready, be ready for the worst. Have, have, a, have the, the kind of interventions. And some of this does come down to uh, finance again, as, as is so often the case. You know, what, what, what could be done? To help, uh, and that's all. That's all being looked at as to what is the right intervention for reasonable worst case, and then you know the other other um, possible outcomes. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> we, we need it. Uh, thanks, Colin. Um, I'm going straight to Martina. You uh, quick off the door, and then after that, be Trevor Lump.
Hello, Martina. <coughs> Not sure in the weather. There she is. Oh, well, she is. There she is. <laughs> you hear this, Martina? She can't get unmuted. I had this issue last week. I think that's it. Like, no, I used to. Oh, Martina. Oh, oh. Oh. The gremlins were trying to keep me quiet. Uh, I couldn't get on mute there, so, so thank you all. And that didn't work. <laughs> and, uh, you behave yourself. Um, I, I want to say in the first instance, I acknowledge the work uh, that Andrew, yourself and your team are doing around all of this. But I have to say that I was somewhat disappointed when I received the Annex A of the outline for, for this committee meeting today. Chair, I want to make the point if I had the luxury of time in my life, which I know that many of us don't, um, I could have Googled this and got the information that's provi provided to us today. So given that we have a civil service form, two things that I noticed, speaking to other colleagues and other committees, there's no standardized committee documents going to, uh, to different committees. And when I looked at this, Obviously, as the chair has said, the language of the common framework can seem like jargon to people. So I think we need to, as a committee, de-jargonize it, if there's such a word, because, uh, chair, this, these common frameworks are, are about the 154 areas where EU law intersects with the, with the North, with the Assembly, with the committee, and these are supposed to be our powers. These are powers that were being transferred to us. Um, and, you know, we're seeing that, that the British government is telling us, no, well, they're going to, um, you know, take a look at these these powers and, you know, before they hand them over to us and who knows doing what to them. So I want to ask Andrew, you mentioned that there were five areas that were supposed to be sorted out before the end of this transition period. And then you says, but that may, over, may only be four. So which of the five that's in front of us uh, may not make that deadline? And then I would like you to explain the 115 policy areas that your paper says, which were identified in 2018 as potentially requiring a common framework arrangement, but have since been reclassified as requiring no further action due to pre-existing work. Well, see, with all due respect, our committee and all the committees are here to scrutinize. And I see this as a big democratic uh, deficit in our ability as MLAs to do our job, to, to look at this these processes, because we're not even going to get a chance to of these online uh, common frameworks or frameworks are put into this kind of a process. So, Chair, in the first instance, I think we need to try and explain to people what this is better. But I also feel that we need to stand over whatever position we're coming at this from, our ability uh, and our competence to, uh, to scrutinise as opposed to what's happening with these 115 areas. Okay, so, so um, the, the, the one that moved the, the, where the, the um, issue arose is, is radioactive substances. So that... that uh, recent work has shown a, a bit of delay on that one. It's being kept under review, still being worked on, but uh, if it's not fully in place, it'll be soon after uh, the end of the transition period. So the, 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 so the, that's the list of five. Uh, the first four of those are still on track. Uh, radio radioactive substances recently reviewed as being not so far advanced. On the 115, I think part of the point in, that, in there is that uh, the, uh, the, there's no no, no outstanding issue as to how, keeping these together. No, no, the, the common framework approach implies and an, a, a degree of working together among the four jurisdictions. If there are already satisfactory arrangements, in other words, if uh, if they're already sufficiently devolved, so so there's no part of the issue and part of the controversy over this whole topic uh, was especially between London and Edinburgh. Uh, uh, and, and this is what gave rise to a big dispute over the Seoul Convention uh, back in 2017, when this was first first going around, where it seemed as though UK government was 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 not moving forward to re-devolve re powers. So powers were coming back from Brussels, but then stop, stopping at Westminster, and the Scots were saying, "No, sorry, 
those fall within the broad scope of devolution, they should automatically come, come to devolution. The, the idea here in the Common Frameworks is, is wh where the, the four jurisdictions identify a valid basis for working together and therefore maintaining something, some way of working together that, that provides for that policy to be better than it would otherwise be the case. But the 115 that, that are mentioned, that, that, yes, we can provide any details you, you need on those. There's no, no difficulty getting you whatever, whatever detail or scrutiny you want to, want to undertake there. But the advice is that those are okay. There's no, there's no, no, there's no, uh, nobody's trying to take anything away from the assembly or undermine the assembly's role. There's, there's no, no, no risk <coughs> of democracy there. If I'm, if I'm not overstating the case there. No, no, I, I would, I would sort of point to the reclassification process. The, the reclassification was also published at the same time as the, as the quarterly report. Uh, there is a process there that looks at each of the frameworks of the reclassification process across each of the four uh, parts of the UK. So it goes through a standard process to assess is an actual framework required. So yes, you're right, there was 160 identified, 160 areas identified that intersected, but that wasn't to say that a framework was needed in every single one of those areas. And there was also a certain amount of consolidation. So there were separate areas, but then a lot of them were sort of grouped together. Um, so the frameworks numbers then reduced down in size. So there is a very clear reclassification process. I say the report has been published and laid in Parliament in that, on that process as well. Um, just maybe to return to your other point about the, the jargon and the, and, the, and the scrutiny by committees. Um, this is a programme where we've had to, and it's maybe just touching on the previous question as well of Collins, about how we manage, to, um, how we manage this programme and how we've had to adapt. So when we started this programme, it was before the protocol came into operation. So as soon as the withdrawal agreement was agreed, then we had to go back and look at all of the frameworks and where they intersected with the protocol and made sure that that was factored into any of the frameworks. The internal market bill is now another area where there's a bit of work going on with the frameworks looking at where they're market orientated, where they're not non-market orientated, or where they might fall into non-discrimination. So as, as things change, we continually have to adapt the programme on that basis. On the scrutiny, the first two uh, that passed JMC EN will be coming to the <laughs> committees. It gives us an opportunity to review the processes because this work is going to stretch way into, into June. So we'd be quite happy to take feedback from the committees on how this works. Obviously, the frameworks will go in front of each of the assemblies and parliament at the same time. That is the purpose of the cross-nation the cross, um, programme board that we have uh, to be able to, to, to keep an eye on this and to work up joint procedures and to iron out things. So we'll be taking <coughs> feedback from all uh, and adjusting that process as we go. So we're quite happy to, you know, to take that feedback as we get to this critical stage because getting confirmation of those first two was a key milestone in this pro programme given how long it has been in operation. Um, can I ask what what's the um, what's the implications for the radioactive substances not being in place by the end of this year? We know that isotopes is very important, particularly for those people that's getting cancer treatment. And uh, so what what happens until we get to that point? And whilst um, I know with sincerity you're telling us that you know it's all going to be okay and that um, the the processes have been followed. But I've been listening intently to what you've been saying about um, um, the four nations, as you call them. Um, you'll forgive me for not seeing uh, the North as a nation, but whatever about the, the four areas and the agreement that has been taking place there. When you look at the framework and you look at the guiding principles, one of the guiding principles is to ensure the recognition of economic and social linkage between the North and South, taking account of the Good Friday Agreement, obviously strand two of the Good Friday Agreement. And when I was going through the documents, I'm looking at cross-border healthcare. I would say that regardless of what tradition we come from, that many of us know someone or know of someone who's gone to the South or elsewhere and the field of that uh, cross-border healthcare. I know for um, for people that was getting hip replacements and others, for instance, they were able to get a feel of the opportunity for the cross-border healthcare. But I don't hear you making a reference to that particular principle when you're talking about either the 115 areas or the other areas. And therefore that concerns me. 
Uh, it concerns me that the importance of the common framework relating to cross-border uh, threats to health, which is again referenced in page 40, 48 of the papers today. So will this common framework in, in any way um, negatively impact on cross-border cooperation? Uh, and we have seen that particularly with COVID-19, but we also um, are aware of the areas of cooperation in the Good Friday Agreement, as well as the other 154 areas that we're dealing with here. Well, no, I'm happy enough to take that. I think, um, as you were, that centrally in, in the Executive Office, we have a role in trying to coordinate it. So the, the policy areas all belong to uh, individual departments. Um, so as part of the oversight process that we would have, uh, so we, we were just advised um, just last week on the DARA DEFRA discussions on the radioactive substances that that one has now slipped slightly. So our role will be through our cross departmental forum to look at the impact of that slippage because just because it slips doesn't mean to say it is one of the priority frameworks, but just because it slips, we need to understand what the impact of that might like might be. So that would be the role that we would have in that. I'm not sure, Michael, not to drop it on you, whether you can add anything on, on the impact of the radioactive substances one or... Um, I, no, the, it will still be the, the impression that I get, or the, the intention is still that it will still be considered by JMCEN for provisional confirmation before the end of December, and then it will be scheduled for scrutiny uh, by the Assembly in 2021, early 2021. So there will still be, it'll be classed as a provisional framework. Uh, from the end of the transition period at, at the end of December. So there will still be working arrangements that are set out, they just won't have been fully implemented. And the the Ford, or the, the Ford administration will all have been working together on, on what they're intending to do from 2021 on. So they will have plans in place on how to, to, how to handle this. So it should be any long-term impact or short-term impact from it not being fully implemented by December. And, and in particular, you know, anything to do with actual operational requirements, uh, you know, that, that's, that'll be managed as part of the operational plan, planning. So uh, um, important substances, making, making sure that the flow of, of, of isotopes, for example, as you mentioned, Martina, the, 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 those practical realities will be managed as, as operational issues. The frameworks are there to set <coughs> the basis for engagement among the four jurisdictions in relation to decision making and policy going forwards and they're designed to, to deal with how uh, legislative and policy making that used to used to involve being part of the EU now works in this uh, exit mode it's, so it's to provide a, 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 an approach to managing and legislating for these issues uh, and should not, will not will not affect the operational side of, of, of the concern you raised there. So that, that's, that, that's, that, that, I think that's an important point to make. Yeah, and I suppose just to follow up on the principles, um, I mean, the principles were agreed at JMCEN at the outset, you know, the executive signed up to those on, in June, but officials in the absence of yeah. having the assembly here worked, uh, I mean, we did as much as we could in working to, on the basis of those principles until they could be signed off. Uh, by the executive, so they are front and centre to the development of the frameworks, um, and all framework areas, all policy areas in all four areas across the UK and in all of the individual departments um, need to abide by those principles in the development of the frameworks. Can can I ask then, given that um, I've I've outlined what principle three is. Um, whilst you talk about the, the four jurisdictions working together, why wasn't health one of the priority areas, uh, particularly um, our location uh, and on an island uh, and working together? And we all know now how we need to be ensuring that it's not just animal uh, welfare that is dealt with on an all-Ireland basis, but human welfare has to be dealt with. But that's particularly important in this context of the EU and what level of uh, engagement is taking place with the Irish government as you are moving through the process of working out um, how these common frameworks are going to be implemented here? Um, all of those things are genuinely being treated according to what is practically possible and, and according to uh, a view of priorities. I, I'm, I'm guessing that 
the health departments everywhere uh, were among obviously the most those most affected by the, the pandemic and therefore were probably prioritizing that work over the policy analysis and, and, and future planning that is inherent in this process in terms of, of looking ahead as to how to manage uh, reciprocal and cross-border health care, as you, as you point out, Martina, or um, in public health. So, so, so r rather than uh, thinking about it in the abstract, because th this is technical and abstract work, because they were having to manage the, the actual um, issues around COVID, I, I assume that's where their energy was going. Uh, and, and that's therefore ha had to work in the operational world uh, and has probably meant that the actual you know, longer term planning process has been delayed. I don't think there's any actual real world detriment as a result of that. No, uh, and you know, I, I would just sort of of actually of making sure that, that, that you know, the, 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 the flow, the, the, the ability to deal with patients on a north south basis, uh, to, to maximise that cooperation, I, I, that's, that's all continuing in the practical real world. Yes, and I, I'm, I mean, at our level within the NICS at the forum that we run, um, we have, obviously, we, we keep an eye on all of the frameworks and the progress that they're making. And, but it isn't just up to us to make that progress. The progress has to be made equally across the UK on that basis. And that's where the upper level of the board comes into play on that, because that's where we can escalate the issues to say, why is this framework not progressing at the speed with which it needs to? And what is the impact of that and the risk associated with it of not? So there are, uh, from our perspective, we feel that there are re reasonably good pro processes in place to keep an eye on that and to monitor it, and also to provide that little bit of scrutiny back down into individual departments who are responsible for the, the frameworks themselves. And just on the principles, I think it's... Correct me if I'm wrong, Lorraine, but, but is it not a fact that, that it was several years ago, during the period when we had no ministers, and they, this emerged, and at that stage it was very uncertain as to, you know, it was long before the protocol as he now know it had come into being, but there was, there was definitely discussion going on about how, how we would be treated here uh, as a result of exit, and there was the, the, the backstop idea around. So I, 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 my recollection, recollection is that we, we proposed the addition of that principle, recognising the need for that to be acknowledged, that, that there was a likelihood that the outcome of the exit process would be uh, some, some arrangement. We didn't know what it would be at the time, but uh, even then, there was clear, clear direction of travel that uh, you know, things would be in some way different in relation to here as compared to across the water. And, and so that therefore, uh, for us to be tied to a purely uh, an arrangement that, that ignored that dimension would have been unhelpful, and so that, that's why I think we, we proposed that principle. As, as I that's recall. right. I think yeah. that was put in at the time specifically to to address our needs. Can I ask, Chair, in relation to then the frameworks, if I'm following your responses right, there will be no framework that will break. Um, the alignment that is required in the Good Friday Agreement, strand two of the Good Friday Agreement, for instance, on health, uh, that there will be no, no framework will, will ensure, or the frameworks will ensure that alignment will take place, even if the British government uh, diverge from that. And secondly, many of the frameworks relate to transport. I was going through them there and drivers, licenses and, and so on. So will the success or failure of these particular frameworks um, affect transport across this island? Uh, so again, the, the, all the work on the frameworks has to be within, I go back to the, to the, the Venn diagram from what Colin said earlier, uh, they'll be uh, they have to have regard for it. They have to be subject to the obligations, the regulatory obligations that arise from the protocol. Uh, and so, so there's a, a, a range of uh, legislative obligations. And so our participation as a region uh, within these frameworks will be constrained by whatever, by, by all, all the legislative obligations that arise from that. And indeed also from the, you know, the practicalities of operating transport systems Across the island, you know, so you, you know you can't. Uh, so, um, if you're going to have uh, a railway system that crosses the border, it's it's got to be working. Whatever, what that, that that has to take primacy. I think that those 
uh, those obligations are, are there and, and need to work practically. And so our contribution to the work uh, within any, anything that's agreed across the four jurisdictions has to be uh, has to leave us able to comply with what might be legal obligations under the protocol. So, so there's no. Uh, it's, a, it's a long, a long yes, Martina, to your question. I think Where, uh, that, oh. that, that bit's that bit's okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm satisfied. Man. Okay, Chair, I have other questions, but look, I know I could hog this meeting talking about the EU, so I will tr resist, and I've said enough. Thank you, uh, Martina. Uh, Trevor Lund, and then I'm not tracking anybody after Trevor for questions. Uh, but... I thought Pat wanted away, is that? I'm okay, Trevor, okay. go ahead. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, <clears throat> I was with the conservation group this morning, actually, and by coincidence, they asked me to answer a question which I couldn't answer, but I'm sure you can. Uh, it's about the, the habitats and the directive and the birds directive it's under one of your categories there, I forget which one, natural biodiversity or something. Um, and they're making the point that if um, whenever, whenever EU law transfers to UK, UK could actually weaken the effect of those directives. And they want to know um, at the moment. I mean, if if UK tried to do that, they would be subject to perhaps court action by the ECJ. But that won't be the case anymore. So, and they're hardly likely to find themselves. So the the question they're asking asking me to ask you is, can Northern Ireland ensure that there would be a legal commitment to the principle of non-regression of nature conservation laws? That's their particular interest, but I'm sure the question would apply to other interests. I could answer that. Uh, probably sits within we need to come back the, the to era. That We'd probably have to take it away and check. That, I don't, that doesn't strike me as a protocol obligation because it's not relating to trading and all you know, the, the main topics in there. But uh, but it may be. Uh, we, let, let's check yeah. out the facts right. uh, and come back to you on that. But I think then, then uh, part of the whole point of all of this is that uh, there should be respect for devolved functions. So if, uh, if any of the... Um, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland want to to maintain a devolved divergence from what England might want or what the UK Parliament might want. That that, that that's part of, of this. That, that this is supposed to be agreeing to work together within a framework. And if if actually there's a a, a desire to either to, you know, to from from one point of view to diverge from EU obligations, on the other hand, to uphold. Those obligations, and if those are the two points of view that are in tension, then th there has to be a way to resolve those uh, under, under this process and get get an acceptable outcome. But I think we need to. We need probably to need to take that question away. Yeah, yeah, well, well, are these devolved matters at the moment? I'm not. So, so they, they, I think the point of all of these is uh, the reason they, these are being yeah. considered is because uh, up to up to this point, because of EU membership, the powers actually lay with Brussels or, or with the EU, the whole EU apparatus, and, and that that so that they were. Uh, in devolved, devolved type functions, um, but in, pra in, in actual reality, pooled by all the member states, all, tw all then 28 member states, working. Uh, so that, that, that was what happened. So then, with EU exit, the question arises: uh, uh, Do they um, are they are they repatriated, so to speak? Um, forgive me, Martina, to um, um, London or? Are they retained by? Are they redevolved back to Edinburgh, Cardiff, and Belfast? Mm -hmm. That's that's the question. I think you know? the yeah. Thanks for that. But I think their worry would be that the there's a UK Environment Bill at the moment that it proposes an Office of Environmental Protection. Yes. It appears to be one of the most useless organisations and and prospect I ever saw because it can't it can't investigate anything except government operations and it can't impose sanctions. So what on earth use is going to be? That's, that's open to question. It's definitely going to be very weak. And we don't have an independent environmental protection agency here, which could perhaps beef the thing up in terms of Northern Ireland. Uh, and that, that's that, that's, that's a long-term controversial issue in which I would hesitate to tread just now in this context. I think that's, that's a matter for further debate. As to as, you know, the, the, This is uh, also a matter for which department is it now? Era as, as in, uh, environmental uh, policy, so I, I, I think that's a matter for you know, using the assembly as to what is the right thing to do about environmental regulation. Uh, so I, I don't think that's 
going to be controlled by this process. That that that'll be a matter for for policy work uh, led by Dara. <coughs> I always seem to be asking you questions that are semi-political. I don't mean to, you know. Uh, but uh, you can come back to me about that's the, first, okay. the first part of the. We'll do our best and come back. Come, come okay, back. Okay. Thank you, Thank you, Trevor. George, can I just confirm you've got no questions? None. None. Yeah. No. Uh, and nobody else has. I'm happy. Wait and see how this develops. <laughs> um, Andy, th thank you very much uh, for you and your and your your team. Um, I, I said it before; it's important. Giving of your time is important to us because um, it helps us under understand, uh, which is really quite complicated. So, so thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much indeed. George, yes. Thank you. Yeah, is he holding a hair comb? <laughs> George, we're not hearing you. Elvis. I've seen pictures of George on his wedding day. It's not that far off, Elvis. Is that right? Yeah, oh, my God. Oh, okay. That is hand. All right, well, listen, he, he can jump in, I'm sure, if he, if he, if he finds his, his, his way. <coughs> um, listen, if, if we can move on to um, item six. Item six is the update on the assessment of the impact of Brexit on the institutions and north and south and east and west relationships, which is supposed to be a departmental written briefing. Uh, we've asked for this time and time again, and time and time again, uh, we have not received it. So we have not got anything for... for um, uh, item six. Um, so uh, I'd like to suggest that, having asked for this time and time again and not received it, that we now ask for an oral evidence session uh, with officials to get an update on this. Uh, if everybody's agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Sorry, there's no problem with openness and transparency in the executive office. <laughs> no, maybe that's more hyperbole. You're very cynical. Oh. Um, if I move to uh, item 7, which is the forward work programme, I uh, reference members to page 58 of the meeting pack for the forward work programme and to page 63 uh, of the meeting pack for an outline of a professional development workshop on effective quest questioning and questioning skills. Uh, and if I can remind members, they did uh, express an interest in this workshop when the committee uh, was first established. I wasn't here. Did we? Uh, apparently. There's a question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, courses can be accommodated through the month of October by Starleaf. Uh, if this is something that mem members are, are interested in doing, or we can leave it to the new year. Um, you know. So the question really is: Do we want to do this next this month, or or do we think with our workload at the moment that we're better leaving this to the new year? Uh, I, I'm inclined to new year. Pat, are you inclined to me? Yes, yes, I did it last week in the health committee, so uh, yeah. I've already done it. So. Uh, any of you online, whether or not we do this, uh, th this this month or just leave it till early next year? Next, next year. Yeah, go yeah. for it. Okay, yeah. um, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just note that, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, so we'll do that um, early mm -hmm. next year. Um, can I also inform members that a briefing by junior minister on Brexit issues has been provisionally scheduled for the 21st of October. Junior ministers are now unavailable during October. The department has asked whether junior minister's November briefing could be brought forward to mid-November rather than the end of November, and that could then cover uh, October and November's meetings, because we would have one a month. Uh, ministers are saying that they are conscious that officials have been to the committee for three weeks running on Brexit along with the First and Deputy First Minister who attended uh, today. Um, so, so I'm seeking your views in regards to this, and I'm very conscious that if we don't have a briefing session till the middle of November, and yet on the, 15th, on the 15th of October is when the deadline is supposed to be for a trade deal, uh, we would be leaving it a month before we got an answer. So uh, we're suggesting that actually we, we asked for officials to come before the committee on the 21st of October to give us a briefing. That's a week after the 15th of October deadline. I'm also, um, also mindful of the fact, Chair, that whilst health has a big hand in formulating sort of COVID regulations, it's the executive office that is the lead department for delivering and implementing them. Now, there's widespread speculation that additional um, strictures are coming down the line. If that is the case, 
I think it's important that officials from the department, if not the ministers, but certainly officials from the department, are on hand to answer questions about them. Uh, because it's TEO that takes this stuff through the assembly. Uh, because you're, you're, you're right, and I, I totally agree with you. So can I say I've got an agreement from uh, members that we're going to ask officials to come on the 21st of October to give us a brief, which is one week roughly after yep. the deadline, which was originally scheduled for a trade agreement? Yes. Yep. Yeah, no sir, sir, can I just add, you know, I, I, know it, I know that there's pressures on time, but I, I just don't find it acceptable that ministers tell us that they can't come anywhere near us for six to seven weeks to discuss Brexit whenever it's about to arrive in about 10 to 12 weeks. And I'm sure their diaries are busy, but what could be more busier than, than in the middle of all of the Brexit negotiations actually updating the scrutiny committee on what's actually happening? I mean, I would have thought that actually we, we could nearly have done with an increase um, in the presentations to the committee as the negotiations continue. Do we find out exactly what has happened? Um, one member of the committee has already highlighted how you could Google from the officials sometimes the information that you get and you could get the report online. Whereas at least with ministers, there's a sense of democratic accountability that if other members ask a question, that we get an honest answer. But to be told that they're, they can't, they're not available for another six weeks, I, I, that just beggars belief. It just says to me that they don't want to come to the committee uh, to discuss things with us. What I, what I would say, uh, because what I would say, um, Colin, is, is I, I agree with you. You're absolutely right. Um, I look at this, and, and if they're saying they are unavailable to come, uh, the junior minister unavailable to come in October. I don't have their diary, so I can't say whether they are or they are not. But somebody certainly needs to come uh, in October to make sure that we're updated. Uh, um, and I, I think. Uh, it's misdirecting to say that they're conscious that they've been here three weeks in a row. If they come to come here every week between now and Brexit, then that's what they have to do. It's that important. So, so, so I, you're absolutely right. Um, so the 21st of October is what we're looking at, Christopher? I, I, I agree with that. Although the one thing that I would say, and most of us in this room have been involved in negotiations, it could become a bit tiresome where you end up with officials turning up or ministers turning up and saying negotiations are ongoing. Uh, it's a fluid situation. We can't update you on any outcomes yet, because you know yourself the nature of these things. The outcomes come late. They come, you know, with deadlines. You know, twelve thirty on the thirty first of December. It'll be, you know, half past two in the morning on the on the first of January. Mm. You know, that's just the way that these things run. So it could become a bit tedious if you're just being told over and over again negotiations are ongoing. The situation's fluid. But I do agree in terms of, you know, if the fifteenth of October is the deadline. I see no reason or it was the deadline, but I see no reason why we can't at least have a briefing after that on the 21st. Yeah, I, I, I agree. So I, I take it all members will agree then 21st that we call for officials to come and give us a, a briefing as to, to where we are. I think that's, right. a, that's important. OK, thank you. Um, uh, I could ask members that they are content then with the forward work programme, uh, which you said they are. Uh, correspondence, uh, there are five items of correspondence at pages 68 to 86 uh, in the meeting pack. Uh, I'm content to note them if any yeah. member has any issue on the rise, uh, Trevor. I'm just I'm reading the one from the Musicians' Union, Yes, Stephen McCann. Um, the, the figures, I mean, we've, we've all been approached about this, and the figures are absolutely horrifying. But uh, is there any way we can press the executive to give us an answer about the use of the, the particular fund, which doesn't appear to have been accessed yet? £29 million pound fund for arts, culture and heritage. It's communities responsible, as far as I understand, yes. it's been worked on. Well, they're, they're, they're written to us. Can we do you want just push it over to the community? They've already given, I think it's five and a half million that's been divvied out. So are you, looking at, are you looking at just a, a little bit of an update and a breakdown? Is that? I think maybe as a committee we could perhaps uh, write to the executive. If they want to push it on to communities, fair enough. But, um, but uh, that, that's about... We could do, but it, it does rest with... I know it's Car Carl's work. Communities. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, OK, well, I'm sure I'll take it up with her. But the, that's You're happy enough. Pretty severe what's going on there. You look at the percentages. You know. Chair. Yes, Martina. Chair, I think separately to that, it might do no harm for at least for us to be furnished with some information because there's 5.5 million. And I understand that we support uh, individuals and SME organisations. The Medellin two tranches. 
the first tranche of it is already out. The second tranche, I think, is due within the next week or two. And that's separately to the 29 million. So maybe it's in terms of us being furnished with that information because there has been a package there. It was put out. Uh, and there's been a number of other fundings um, that uh, funding streams that people have been able to tap into. So sometimes I think it's maybe the scale of it that maybe we're all not capturing it because we're in different committees. But it's I mean I it was something I had to actually ask the minister uh, and her officials about. So I was quite pleased to find out that the 5.5 million of support is separately to the or separate to the 25 or 29 million, and that's being worked on as well. Well, that's true. So, I mean, we could we could, so we could write to the, D- the Department of Communities if you want that clarified. Yeah, well, let, let's 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 write a couple of letters and and, uh, and we'll see if we can get some answers. Just uh, if nothing more than to improve our knowledge of what of what's going on. It doesn't doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah, great. Everybody have it good enough. Um, just moving on to chairman's uh, business. Um, uh, and if I can remind members that uh, I met informally with representatives from the historical institutional abuse groups, which is Rodinsetta Trust and the Survivors Northwest, last Thursday. Uh, I'll tell you that I passed on apologies for all of you. I know how busy it was last Thursday, um, uh, and I explained that to them. Um, where they were slightly disappointed that, that I was on my own, uh, actually they fully understood the situation that we were finding ourselves in um, just under a, a week ago. Uh, the meeting lasted for about uh, an hour and 25 minutes. Um, it was a, a, a extremely good meeting, I have to say, uh, and I was uh, both impressed um, by those who were present uh, and moved by their testimony and, and humbled um, by their stoic um, resolve to, to see this through. I, I did promise them that I would brief um, the committee briefly on what they said to me. Um, and I, if, I, if, if I can bear with me just for uh, a moment, um, I'll do that now. Um, first of all, they, they, they spoke about the redress um, statistics. Um, I know we got a little bit about from the first and deputy first minister. Um, they went to a little bit more detail, uh, and the redress board has received 570 applications. There have been 142 determinations, with an 11 initial payments already been made, uh, and 22 applications which have been adjourned by a panel for further information to be provided. Uh, and the amount of the determinations so far is 4.1. Uh, million pounds. That, that's a one-third hit rate um, of applications, uh, and that's not bad. And we're talking about from the first of April or the end of March um, that they've hit a hit, hit rate of, of, of about a third of those people who have uh, applied. Um, of course, there will be people who are, are stuck in the system, and theirs has taken longer. But but they're saying that it's moving. They they came across and said they were pretty happy with with what they were seeing. The other thing that they recommended, and, and it would put, be something I would put to um, the committee, uh, is that we ask the redress board quarterly for a breakdown of these figures. Uh, they're easy to get. You just ask for them and they give you a breakdown so we understand where it's going. And it might be a good procedure to do when we start doing the victim's payment scheme so we can keep a track on how that runs when it kicks in. So I, I, I would recommend that we ask for to do that uh, once a quarter. Um, for the committee. Um, anybody got any views on that? that sounds good. Fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, they also mentioned that the issue about HMRC and the Department of Work and Pensions. Uh, if you get um, an award um, here in Northern Ireland, it, you do not pay tax or, or anything to the Department of uh, Work and Pensions. However, if you move to England or further abroad, you do. Um, uh, and they're asking if there's anything we can do to try uh, and address that. Uh, I believe that we should write to uh, the finance minister and ask what he has had discussions with in regards to the treasury, in regards to that, because a victim in Northern Ireland who decides to live in England should be treated exactly the same as a victim who is here uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, Has anybody got any comment or is everybody happy enough with that? It wouldn't apply to lump sum payments, would it? Or Sorry? Would it apply to lump sum payments or just to pensions? It, it, it applies to, to everything, to, to be honest. Um, and there's also issues about um, if any of them get taken into care as well. Um, so, oh, yeah, yeah. so so if they get taken into care in Northern Ireland, none of that money will be used for their care. But over in England, because it's devolved to different authorities across in England, 
they, they, it's different rules will apply to them. So it's trying to even it all up right across um, the whole of the United uh, Kingdom. And, and, I, and I'll admit now, I, I don't know the effect of that um, to, in the Irish Republic. I, I just forgot to ask, but it's certainly maybe something we can ask in regards to that. Um, they spoke to me about the apology that we've heard a lot about, and they've been working for months to try and formulate the, the words of the apology so um, that meets best what victims want uh, and the apology is important to them uh, and what's the apology trying to achieve but they're very keen to, to make sure that we knew that um, they have been working on this um, to, to try and come up with a form of words uh, and the last point and I think this is quite interesting because Christopher mentioned that because they talked about memorialisation and they don't want to see statues they want to see a living memorial. They want to see the likes of a bursary for mm. kids or things like that. So, so they want to see that. And that was a really you know, heartfelt plea by them, is that they get involved in, in whatever that is happening in regards to the memorialisation and that it's not just a statue. I, I did not kick back, but it says that sometimes the memorial, when it's a physical item, is not necessarily for the victims, but it's for the rest of society to look at it and say, we didn't treat these people properly. But, but, I mean, their overriding point was that they would rather have a living memorial. Um, and, and, and I would like to, to think when we get the new um, commissioner in to speak to us that we can raise that issue uh, of memorialisation, but certainly down the, 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 the line that, that Christopher was, 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 was taking. And the last point I, I will mention... On on that particular issue, because I know we're talking to some of the victims whilst they have expressed that view uh, that you outlined, and as the uh, the minister said, we have to ensure whatever is agreed is co-designed and it's not done to them, uh, but it's done with them. They've also referenced the fact that many people have died. Many of these victims have died before they got to this point of redress. And if there was going to be memorials discussed, that the headstones on the graves of some of those victims that don't yet have a headstone would be at least taken into consideration by ourselves when we're having these kind of conversations. Uh, th thank you for that, um, Martina. You, you, you're right, actually, and they did mention that with me. It, it wasn't one of the substantive points I was mentioned, but, but you're absolutely right to, to raise that, and it's certainly something that we need to raise uh, with the Victims Commissioner in regards to that. And the last point, and I think it's only fair that I, that I raise it, uh, is w we know there has been a falling out between some of the victims' groups and the interim advocate, uh, and they wanted to just make it clear that they had a really good relationship and working relationship uh, with the interim advocate and, and and I think it's right and fair that where some did not that's not reflective of all and, and we do find that in the nature of, of victims that not everybody is in the same path in the same lane but I think it's right and fair that, that um, I mentioned the fact is that they said they had a really exceptional working relationship with the, with the interim uh, advocate uh, and, and that was it but um, I certainly uh, on the back of it personally intend to, to get in touch with them and go and meet them in their own turf, I think, um, uh, because it, it was such an uplifting meeting uh, over what was a pretty awful time in people's lives. Um, uh, you know, I, I think I would like to follow up on it, but um, unless anybody's got any points in regards to that, that was a brief that, that I got from them. Any, uh, anybody got any questions? No, that's fine. Okay, uh, any other business? Any members got any other business? No, okay, so the next meeting is next Wednesday, the 14th of October, uh, in room uh, 30. Uh, and as I asked last year, if you're going to attend, please make sure the, the staff know that you're going to attend so we can make sure this room is set out uh, properly. Uh, thank you all again for today. I thought some of the questioning uh, was, was outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. And that's us. The Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30.